record niya ko. Hello, good afternoon. Narinig po ba ako?
Okay, uh, while we wait for uh, other participants na makapasok sa ating meeting room, um, perhaps we can start in two minutes. Okay, so habang hinihintay po natin lahat na makatasok, uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, on behalf of the Center for Women's Resources and our partners Gabriela and Voices of Women for Justice and Peace, I would like to welcome you all to our webinar titled Pandemic Tales, Women and Human Rights in the Time of COVID-19. I am Eds De La Cruz, Advocacy and Media Officer of the Center for Women's Resources and I will serve as the moderator for today's um, webinar. So, bago tayo formal na magsimula no, sa ating um, discussions, uh, a few reminders para po sa lahat. Um, first, please put your audio on mute para po marinig natin ng malinaw ang ating mga resource persons. Um, if you have questions or clarifications, feel free to send us a message on the chat box. Um, we will address all your questions during the open forum. And if you have stories to share about your experiences related to human rights, kindly send us a message para po ma-line up namin kayo during the open forum. Um, lastly, uh, we made sure, of course, medyo maraming Zoom bombing incidents in the recent past. Um, we made sure na safe ang ating um, espasyo na ito para sa lahat na makapag-share. And we would really appreciate it if you will help us make this space a safe space for everyone and address each one of us with respect. Um, only registered and verified participants are allowed to join us in our Zoom um, conference. However, naka-livestream din po tayo sa ating Facebook, sa Facebook page ng Center for Women's Resources. So, if you happen to be one of the registered participants, kindly make sure um, na gamit po ninyo yung registered names ninyo para madali kayong mapapasok ng ating tech um, team. So, before we begin, we would like to thank everyone who registered and find time uh, to attend our webinar today. And the roster of our participants is very diverse. Those who registered um, came from academe, media, embassies, um, national agencies, national government agencies, and some local and international non-government organizations. So, we would like to acknowledge the following organizations who will be joining us today. Siguro yung iba medyo hahabol pa, no? Dahil maaga-aga pa naman. So, these organizations are, are as follows. British Embassy, German Embassy Manila, National Association for Social Work Education, um, Embassy of Sweden, Philippine Normal University, Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation, International Association of Women in Radio and Television, International Women's Rights Action Watch, Asia Pacific, Bataan Peninsula State University, Sacred Heart Parish Credit Cooperative, OSU, Plan International, University of St. Lasalle, UP Visayas Gender and Development Program, Care Philippines, um, Department of Social Welfare and Development, Central Office, Center for Trade Union and Human Rights, Assumption College of Davao, Pamantasan ng Lunsod ng Maynila, University of the Philippines Diliman, UP College of Social Work and Community Development, Pan-Asia Pacific, Bicol University, Mediators Network for Sustainable Peace, 
University of Northern Philippines, Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Gabriela Davao City, Cavite State University Imus Campus, Gabriela Youth, Act Philippines, Gabriela DC, Gabriela Network of Professionals, San Sebastian College, Health Organization for Mindanao, Philippine Commission on Women, Iloilo Pride Team, Women's Global Network for Reproductive Rights, United Nations Population Fund, Jazz Southeast Asia, University of Batanga Psychology Department, ABS-CBN Corporation, AFS Foods and Food Services Inc., La Consolacion University, um, Philippines, St. Francis Square Group of Companies, Solid Point Manpower and Allied Services Inc., Center for People's Media, NIDEC Philippines Corporation, First Research, Board of Women's Work, United Methodist Church, Coleo de San Juan de Letran, UP Open University, and Diwang Mapag Kalinga. So now that we more or less know who, we, who are joining us today, I would like to properly introduce the host organization, um, the Center for Women's Resources. It's a women's institution that provides research, education and training, advocacy and data banking services for and about women for more than three decades. As one of the pioneering women's institutions in the Philippines, the CWR aims to empower grassroots women through raising awareness and supporting their efforts in improving their situation through structural change. Given that, the CWR has consistently created spaces in which issues of women, especially those in the marginalized sectors, may be discussed to a broader audience. In fact, um, since the implementation of Enhanced Community Quarantine, the CWR has hosted four webinars on various issues that confront women in the time of COVID-19 lockdown. And in our previous webinars, we have tackled issues of violence against women, women's health, and women's work and livelihood. So this afternoon, we will be discussing yet another issue that has affected not only women, but many other sectors as well. Karapatang Pantao, or human rights. And while millions of Filipinos struggle to confront the threats of COVID-19 and the impacts of consequent lockdown, the government has seemingly imposed a military-driven approach to address the pandemic. And this approach has expectedly resulted to more threats and abuses. Um, interestingly, as the country's COVID-19 cases crossed the 10,000 mark this week, the number of arrested individuals under the imposed lockdown has already breached the 100,000 mark. And apart from that, human rights defenders were either killed or arrested for continuing their cause of providing help to the public. Add to that the recent closure of one of the biggest broadcast networks in the country, the abs -CBN. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our main speakers for today who will be talking about human rights situation in the Philippines. So our first main speaker is a member of the Voices of Women for Justice and Peace and Assistant Secretary General for Legal Services of the National Union of People's Lawyers. Uh, may we call Ms. Uh, Attorney Josa Denla. Attorney Josa. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Yes, Attorney. Magandang magandang hapon sa ating lahat and thank you for the organizers. Uh, for sharing this platform uh, where I wish to impart practical knowledge of the law and basic understanding of our human rights, which can really come in handy in these difficult times. So I will focus on our right to liberty as well as our freedom of expression. And uh, I would like to start with a brief overview of the situation on human rights um, right now. But prior to uh, the island of Luzon being placed under the enhanced community quarantine. In recent years, uh, this regime, uh, can we go to the first slide, please? In recent years, this regime has removed a chief justice, uh, jailed a senator, incarcerated scores of uh, political activists and uh, dissenters of this government. So in, just yesterday, it shut down one of the major media networks in the country. And 
in our communities, on the streets, uh, petty sovereigns in the person of armed police are roaming and uh, seemingly, uh, as they are arbitrarily arrest the hungry and the disgruntled, uh, making hunting grounds no, of the, especially of the poor uh, and the hungry in urban poor communities. And while these are happening, contagions are breaking inside our prisons and detention facilities where the lives of uh, vulnerable detainees, those belonging to at-risk groups, uh, and political prisoners as well, who have literally nowhere to go, are in great peril. So the Duterte's uh, inept the Duterte government's inept response to the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated inequality to the worst levels. While many of its absolute, absolutist ideas have also continued to unfold. So along with the public health emergency, we are also seeing a human rights crisis, which is actually just a symptom of a rotten and unjust social order that has long been there. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the vicious new normal that we are seeing around us is the worst of the same old. We are under a lockdown where our rights are under crackdown. Communities, especially of the urban poor, like uh, as I said earlier, are hunting grounds no, for, of the police hunting, capturing, and caging. Um, So-called quarantine breakers or violators of uh, the curfew. Nabalitaan nyo na ba yung iba't ibang orma ng arbitraryong paghuli at pagpaparusa sa kanila. Meron akong nabalitaan na kinulong sa kabaong, merong pinag-jumping jacks, merong mga miyembro na LGBTQ community na pinag-sex si dance, merong pinahawak sa lubid, sa kalookan, sa loob na ilang oras, binilad sa araw, uh, ikinulong sa gym nang hindi binibigyan ng tubig at pagkain sa loob ng uh, mahabang panahon, at napakarami pa. So our law enforcers are fabricating order. Can we go back to the uh, the prior slide, please? Fabricating order in their camouflage uniforms using martial law-like uh, measures, yung militarization and militarized response that tinatawag natin. Now uh, you can see in my uh, in this slide the leftmost photo of a a policeman in their camouflage uniform. Ito yung sinusuot nila ngayon, di ba? Yan yung mga nakikita natin, nasuot nila. And I downloaded this photo from the website of the PNP. Did you know that this camouflage photo is for the exclusive use of uh, PNP personnel uh, assigned in regional and police mobile groups uh, to handle counterinsurgency operations in uh, rural and forested areas? So what does this tell us, di ba? Why are they doing this? Uh, their concern really is to treat this um, crisis as a security issue more than anything else. They need to all, do all these measures to counter unrest from the poor and the hungry. So lockdown, in other words, is essentially counterinsurgency. And we have to be wary of this because our rights will be affected. Uh, the photo in the middle, nakikita nyo yan, yung maraming police. It's a formation of more than a thousand police personnel, uniform personnel in Divisoria. Totoban mo yun nandyan sa gilid. And I source this from the Manila PIO. Uh, the, this district in Manila was recently placed under 48-hour lockdown, if I'm not mistaken. At alam naman natin, sa Tondo area, sunod-sunod yung mga sunog na nangyayari. Uh, kung saan yung marami ng nagugutom ay nawalan pa ng mga tahanan. Uh, yung nasa kanan na naman na photo, it's, it's uh, one of the usual scenes we see outside. Manning the checkpoints are police in their camouflage uniforms. At yung di pa natin nakikita, uh, working behind the scenes, are the um, military bureaucrats occupying uh, the NTF uh, who is supposed to implement the policy of this government in um, combating COVID-19. Next slide, please. In the next slide, you will see the figures. Uh, this is based, uh, I think, from based on data from the PNP as of April 2020. I haven't seen uh, the updated figures, but they take pride in this, that uh, they have uh, apprehended a total of 136 1,517 cases of quarantine violations as of April 20, and 
of this a significant number, 31,363, uh, involved the arrests of individuals. Now, this begs the question, do these arrests actually reduce crime and make ordinary people feel safer? My answer is no, and I dare say that in the first place, a majority of these arrests, uh, which uh, purportedly involve violations of uh, the RAO 11332 or the Mandatory Reporting of Notifiable Diseases Act and the Bayanihin to Heal as One Act or RA 11469, there are no crimes to speak of. And instead of feeling safe, we feel fear. How many of us have thought twice uh, before going out, baka nakalimutan natin mga quarantine passes, yung mga ID, no, bago tayo lumabas, to get uh, essential goods and services. Uh, ilan ba sa atin yung nagdalawang isip kung ipopost ba natin sa ating mga social media accounts ay ikakapahamak ba natin? So what this government is creating is security only for itself to the end that it will be able to maintain the status quo and perhaps preserve power for itself. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights has sounded the alarm on the militarized response of the national government here in the Philippines on the COVID, to the COVID-19 crisis. Now, while the UN and many of the member states of the UN recognize that emergency measures are necessary to address uh, this pandemic of global proportions, there must be uh, emergency measures. But uh, we have always emphasized this in our discussions as human rights lawyers that there must be no trade-off between these emergency measures and our human rights. Emergency measures should not be at the expense of human rights. In fact, our constitution and our laws are still effective even during, even during martial law. The, uh, the principle of uh, civilian supremacy will still be uh, adhered to or observed. Now, some rights, such as our freedom of move movement and liberty of abode, or for some, have already been subjected to reasonable restrictions. Uh, dahil nga meron tayong public health emergency at nakisama naman talaga tayo dyan. But the UN issued, um, UNOHCHR issued guidelines that uh, governments must adhere to when uh, enacting emergency measures and general legality, necessity, Proportionality and non-discrimination. So non-discrimination, I would just, just like to share that uh, these measures shall not um, discriminate contrary to provisions of international human rights law this, or, or discriminate against groups based on sex, gender, or sexual orientation, uh, and political beliefs. So in our organizations, whenever we assess the impact of uh, these emergency measures, by the government on human rights, we can use uh, these parameters. Uh, the, these emergency measures should also not be used to target particular individuals or groups, including uh, minorities, or uh, yung bagit ko kanina, on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability na rin. And it should always be, at all times, guided by uh, human rights principles, including transparency. It should not be used for any other purpose. Kung may emergency measures yan, para lang uh, i-address or tugunan yung crisis, no more, no less. It should, no, uh, should not be used to stifle dissent. And transparency should uh, be supreme. Right to information is very important. Uh, and this requires media freedom. This requires that media freedom is protected as journalism serves as a crucial serves a crucial function during the emergency. This brings to mind uh, the uh, most uh, poor populations sa bansa na wala na mga access sa mga black boxes or sa online content. Those who cannot uh, watch the news from Facebook or, or online from websites uh, and who depend on ABS-CBN. So malaki yung, yung impact ng shutdown na ito sa kanilang access to information at a time when literally information can save lives. Like, next slide, please. Now, uh, dahil ang gobyerno natin ay nag-focus sa militaristang approach sa kung paano tutugunan ang crisis, necessarily, 
uh, mayroong mga criminal laws that ha are being um, enforced. And these criminal uh, laws or penal laws uh, involve penalties. Now, penalties for violations of extraordinary emergency measures must be humane and proportionate. It cannot, they cannot be arbitrary and discriminatory. And deprivation of liberty, yung pagkulong, yung paghuli, must be a last resort. Dapat habaan yung pangunawa nila sa mga mamamayan na kinakailangan lumabas, kinakailangan humanap ng pagkain, ng gamot at iba pang mga pangangailangan para mabuhay dahil napakahirap ng sitwasyon ngayon. And the fines, uh, which are also being imposed for violations of uh, curfew and other ordinances, should be commensurate to the seriousness of the offense committed. And criminal penalties for expression, you adding uh, freedom of speech or freedom of expression. Next slide, please. Now, as to law enforcement and emergency measures, uh, law enforcement. Uh, authorities must strictly adhere to the rule of uh, proportionality and necessity when responding to threats. So, na naalala ko yung kaso ni Corporal Winston Ragos uh, na binarel ng walang laban at wala namang armas. If, we, if you've seen the videos, uh, he actually provided a long opportunity, a long time, a uh, considerable opportunity for the police to accost him. Yung nakatalikod siya, di ba? Ang tagal nun, at nakataas pa yung kamay. At uh, sa pagkakataon na yun, there was no longer any uh, imminent threat to the lives of the police and the people around them. So definitely, uh, yung, yung proportionality na tinatawag natin and yung mga rules on the use of lethal force were violated. At I'm sure in, in many other cases, I also remember the case of the fish vendor in, who was arrested in Panay Avenue and was beaten by five or six uh, officials of the Task Force Disciplina of Quezon City. Pinagtulungan siya at, at kinaladkad dahil wala siyang face mask. So nakikita natin na itong mga uh, nabalitang ito ay ilan lamang sa mga examples kung saan hindi sinusunod yung mga pandaigdigang pamantayan tungkol sa pagpapatupad ng emergency measures. Next slide, please. I already mentioned this earlier. A state of emergency should not be used to stifle dissent. Transparency and media freedom is very important. On this photo is my colleague, uh, Attorney A.K. Gillian, who is the Secretary General of NUPL Panay. He was one of those arrested on Labor Day last May 1, together with 41 other uh, activists who were protesting the extrajudicial killing of Jory Porquia by Muna coordinator who was killed the day before. And here he was rendered, meron pang ibang layer, meron pang ibang level of um, violation sa kanya kasi he was rendering legal assistance to his clients and yet he was also arrested and charged with um, or uh, is set to undergo preliminary investigation for crimes like uh, illegal public assembly, yung violation da of the Bayanihan Act, particularly yung impeding access to roads, and other ridiculous charges. A next slide, please. Now, another colleague said this in her Facebook. Duralex said Duterte. I'm sure after the, uh, the ABS-CBN shutdown uh, happened, the other... Was it the other day? Uh, and dami naglabasan ng mga pro uh, administration or Duterte apologists saying that the law is the law. The law may be harsh, but it is the law. Quoting this um, Latin maxim, yung uh, dura lex sed lex. But then, this, uh, this Latin maxim is being used to justify the weaponization of the law against critics, against dissenters, against ordinary citizens who are merely voicing out their sentiments or are disgruntled by the ineptness of, the resp of uh, this government in responding to the COVID-19 crisis. And for advocates of, this, uh, of, the, of the original maxim, this can only be acceptable if the system is near perfect or perfect, where the parties are assured of absolute fairness and where the system is not lopsided or rigged in favor of the more powerful in the first place. No? And unfortunately, 
unfortunately, harsh lang talaga ang batas kapag ina-apply ito sa mga ordinaryong mamamayan, sa mga kritiko, sa mga aktivista. Pero kapag kakampi ng administrasyon, temper the rigors of the law with compassion. So, I'm, I'm looking at you, Senator. Coco Pimentel, Moka Uson, no? yung double standards ng batas ay kitang-kita sa mga panahon na ito. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I would like you to, uh, to remember this important principle in criminal law. May Latin maxim din ito, yung nulum crimen, nula sine pine lege, no crime without a law. There's no crime when there's no law prohibiting a particular act or omission. Ngayon, ang, ang mga lagi nating na babalitaan no, na grounds for the arrests of people are that they did not observe um, social distancing by holding uh, mga cases kanina ng mga aktivista, public assemblies, or that they did not wear face masks or face shields or protective personal equipment, or they did not bear quarantine passes upon going out of their houses. Uh, bago tayo ma-arresto, dapat mayroong legal grounds at dapat mayroong batas na nagbabawal sa kung ano man yung ating violation. So we need to inquire what is the basis of our arrest. And together with this um, principle that there's no crime without law, let's also remember that criminal and penal statutes or laws must be strictly construed against the state and in favor of uh, the accused in favor of the ordinary citizens, meaning the provisions of the law cannot be enlarged, they cannot be modified, they are not to be extended no? uh, by implication or by analogy, they are not to be strained by construction to spell out a new crime or multipl multiply felonies or uh, offenses that are not found within the four corners of the law. Wag, ipig wag ipagpilitan kung ano yung hindi isinasaan. Sa batas. Now, itong mga nakikita nyo, yung, yung wearing of face masks, quarantine passes, mass gathering slash social distancing, these are uh, enjoined in, IATF, in the IATF Omnibus Guidelines on the Implementation of the Enhanced Community Quarantine, uh, which were recently adopted by President Duterte in his Executive Order 112. Yung, uh, where he approved uh, IATF resolution number 30 and other 30-A uh, and other resolutions uh, to uh, provide guidelines in high-risk geographic areas still under ECQ and even on uh, even on those areas under GCQ from May 1 to May 15. Ngayon, kung babasahin natin yung resolution na ito ng IATF at yung kanilang omnibus guidelines, they merely enjoin LGUs uh, to enact ordinances requiring the wearing of face masks. Uh, and these uh, guidelines, uh, needless to state, are not penal laws. Why? Because the president has no power to enact criminal laws. This power is ex uh, exclusively resides in Congress and by delegation of Congress to the sanggunian of the local government units under the local government code. Dahil alam natin na yung mga... Uh, iba't ibang sanggunian ng mga LGUs ay may kapangyarihan na mag-enact ng ordinansa sa kanilang mga nasasakupan within their territorial jurisdiction. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss this further, but I would like you to, next slide please, to look uh, closely at the laws that are being used by uh, law enforcement in making the, um, the arrests of uh, people who go out of their homes just because, just because uh, they were not wearing masks or not bearing quarantine passes, and such other violations. The first uh, law uh, that's being implemented right now is RA-11332, or the Mandatory Reporting of Notifiable Diseases and Health Events of, of Public Health Concern Act. RA-11332 under Section 9. Uh, look at uh, Section 9E, non-cooperation of the person or entities identified as having the notifiable disease or affected by the health event of public concern. Ang kalimitan, ikinakaso yan yun eh. Section 9E, yung nabalitaan natin mga hinuli sa Norzagaray, Bulacan, yung San Roque, uh, 21, yung Iloilo, 41, lahat yan kasama, Section 9E. Hindi raw kasi, hindi raw kasi sila nagko-cooperate dahil bahagi sila nung, nung uh, populasyon na affected 
ng COVID-19 crisis. Now, the question is, can the police arrest a protester or any person deemed violating ECQ rules on the ground that uh, affected siya ng health event of public concern like the COVID-19? No, unless that person was previously identified as uh, affected by COVID-19, such as being classified as a PUI or PUM under the old classification, under the new classification, yan na yung mga suspect, or even probable cases. Definitely, kasama na dyan yung person uh, who has been diagnosed or has been tested positive for COVID-19. Ang problema dito, uh, the disease is asymptomatic in some at kulang tayo sa mass testing. So, we cannot know and we cannot uh, expect people to know if they are affected in this way that they are already considered PUM, PUI, or are carrying the disease. Diba? So, ang crucial element dito, dapat identified na sila uh, to be sick of uh, COVID-19 or yung, uh, yung iba pang classifications na kailangan mag-practice mag ng self-quarantine. Uh, not wearing a mask or going out without a quarantine pass, not maintaining social distancing is not covered in the offense. Uh, yun na nga, unless uh, previously identified na as a uh, uh, COVID-19 carrier or PUMPUI. At nagre-refuse siyang mag-cooperate sa authorities uh, sa pag-contain at sa pagpigil ng transmission ng sakit. Again, babalik tayo dun sa principle no, ng strict interpretation of the law. Kung wala dyan, hindi po yun ipinagbabawal as a crime. Next slide, please. Now we go to the Bayanihan to Heal As One Act, RA 11469, which is mainly a law that grants uh, powers to the president to realign the budget, marshal resources to fund the COVID-19 response. Uh, dito sa Section 6, kung mabasahin natin lahat ng uh, ipinagbabawal and prohibited acts, wala ang kapangyarihan, ang presidente, ang police, law enforcement, at kahit sino pa, sa estado na humuli at magditini ng mga tao for violation of quarantine rules. Uh, just to give you uh, an idea, ito yung, yung the rest of the prohibited acts under Section 6. Letter A, LG officials disobeying national government policies. B, private hospitals and vessels refuse to operate despite directives. C, hoarding, profiteering, and injurious speculations. D, refusal to accept contracts for necessary materials and services. E, refusal to provide 30-day grace period required by the law. F, creating or spreading false information regarding the COVID-19 crisis. I will discuss this further. Pagpunta natin sa freedom of expression. G, failure to comply with reasonable limitations on land, sea, or air transportation. And H, impeding access to roads, putting up obstacles, or maintenance of illegal construction that have been ordered to be removed. Again, yung mga nabanggit na uh, usual violations na nagiging dahilan ng paghuli sa mga mamamayan ay wala sa Bayanihan to Heal as One Act. Next slide, please. Ngayon, kung wala sa Bayanihan to Heal as, as One Act, wala rin dun sa RA11332, hindi kaya naman na sa Public Assembly Act. At least uh, in those cases involving uh, a number of people who went out of their houses to provide relief. Yung mga, o kaya naman yung humihingi ng relief sa labas, kagaya ng San Roque 21, kagaya nung mga kabataan na hinuli sa Quezon City noong May 1 din. Uh, habang sila ay uh, nag, uh, nagsasagawa ng community kitchen, kagaya ng Marikina 10, na in the middle of their relief operations and cooking hot meals for uh, poor families in Marikina City. Holding a crime, a holding, uh, I'm sorry, holding a protest action is not a crime in the, Filip in the Philippines, even under BP 880 or the Public Assembly Act. Let us remember that this law uh, merely regulates the time, manner, and place of conducting public assemblies, although meron din siya mga penal provisions for certain violations. But I would like you to, uh, to note that there's a principle here under Section 9 that mandates law enforcement authorities not to interfere uh, with the holding of a public assembly. They cannot uh, interfere with the holding of a public assembly. All they can do is uh, adequately ensure public uh, safety 
by stationing personnel, uh, uniform personnel, in a place at least 100 meters away from the area of activity, ready to maintain peace order at all times. At in fact, yung prohibited acts under Section 13, nakikita nyo sa slide, letters B, C, D, E, and E, pertain to law enforcement authorities. At pansin niyo letter D, obstructing, impeding, disrupting, or otherwise denying the exercise of the right to peaceful assembly. Nagiging uh, illegal lamang kung mayroong mga violent acts, kagaya ng pagdadala ng, uh, ng deadly weapons, yung mga ganun, saka lang maaaring uh, kasuhan ng violations ng Public Assembly Act. And even those who are attending uh, rallies, kahit na walang permit, no, should not be arrested and charged and should not be held liable under this law. Dahil dito, ang pwede lang kasuhan ay yung organizers. And even organizers of rallies na wala raw permits ay hindi na dapat hinuhuli at dapat ay kinakasuhan na lamang ng violations uh, under this law. Next slide, please. There is another provision uh, there's another law, a provision from the Revised Penal Code, which is a uh, public disorder, Article 151, Disobedience to Persons in Authority. Now, I'm bringing your attention to this because uh, in cases where there were no violations, uh, police eventually filed charges for uh, disobedience to them daw ng mga taong inaresto nila. So, lumalabas sa umpisa, wala namang ginagawang violations. Pero dahil di umano nanlaban o hindi sumunod sa kung ano man yung sinabi nila, kinakasuhan na nila ng disobedience to persons in authority. Now, ang importanteng tandaan natin sa uh, batas na ito, uh, mahalaga na mayroon munang kautosan na sinasabi yung law, enforce, yung law enforcer. Hindi niya pwedeng damputin lang dahil uh, nag-violate sa quarantine rules kagaya ng hindi pagsusuot ng face mask. Kung yun yung logic nila, eh di virtually all other violations of criminal laws no, uh, will give rise to violations of Article 151. They have to, ha to have made verbal orders first, unequivocal orders to the person that the person did not, uh, did not follow. In one case, uh, this concerns uh, uh, an accused in a checkpoint who was uh, charged with Article 151, he followed naman the rules, he stopped his vehicle, rolled down the windows, and talked to the police. The police, however, asked him to alight from the vehicle, uh, to be frisked, and uh, for his vehicle to be searched. Hindi siya pumayag kasi alam niya yung karapatan niya. And, uh, uh, giniit niya na only... Uh, yung search in plain view lang yung pwedeng gawin ko. Ano lang yung nakikita from outside ng mga police yung pwedeng gawing search doon sa kanyang sasakyan. At kaya nagkaroon ng, ng sagutan na yabangan yung police, hinuli siya, ikinulog at kinasuhan ng Article 151. So, sounds familiar, no? Parang yung nangyari kay uh, yung doon sa residente naman ng San Lorenzo Village sa Makati kung saan nayabangan din yung police kaya ayun, uh, sinubukan siyang hulihin sa driveway ng sarili niyang bahay. Um, sabi ng Supreme Court dun sa binanggit ko na kaso, not only should the law enforcement authority uh, make a verbal order or have made an order that the, uh, the person being, uh, the person arrested did not follow, the order must also be lawful. In this case, uh, tama yung iginiit nung akusado na meron nga naman siyang karapatan against unreasonable search and seizure. Therefore, he is not guilty. He was a judge not guilty of Article 151. So, tandaan natin na kapag tayo yung uh, sinisita or whatever violations, we should hold our ground and assert our rights. We should ask first and for foremost what our violations are. But we must do this in uh, the calmest way possible. Alam ko na mahirap yung gawin, nakakainip talaga ng ulo kapag uh, mayabang yung yung law enforcer dahil may baril at uh, threatening intimidating yung kanyang asta but we have to uh, do this so that we will not uh, render ourselves liable uh, for violation of article 151 next slide please earlier i mentioned that the 
IATF guidelines, omnibus guidelines, enjoined LGUs to enact ordinances prohibiting um, certain practices or certain acts uh, to help contain the COVID-19 uh, in the communities uh, <clears throat> or prevent the further transmission in the communities. Ngayon, ang batas na nag-govern dito, yung Local Government Act, Art, uh, Republic Act 7160. At uh, dito, mayroong mga, mga, pa, mga pamantayan, may standards, both procedural and substantive, that the sanggunian or the lawmaking body of the barangay, municipality, city, or province must observe. It's important that uh, the ordinance be published uh, in the within the territorial jurisdiction of the LGU concerned. Now, how uh, do they do this? It, uh, the ordinance can only take effect after 10 days from posting in a bulletin board at the entrance to the provincial capital, municipal, or barangay hall, as the case may be, and in at least two other conspicuous places in the LGU concerned. The text of the ordinance must also be disseminated in Filipino or English and in the language understood by the majority of the people in the LGU concerned. Now, in addition, and this is important, in ordinances with penal sanctions, they should be published in a newspaper of general circulation within the province where the Sangguniaan concern belongs. At dahil nga, uh, the times are, are not normal, so in the absence of any newspaper of general circulation, pwede pa rin tong gawin. By posting the ordinances with penal sanctions in the municipalities and cities of the province where the Sangguniaan of origin is situated. So kailangan Ang nating tanungin kapag tayo ay uh, hinuhuli sa di umanong paglabag sa quarantine violations at sinasabi sa atin na mayroon ng ordinansa, kung ano ang ordinansa, ano ang sinasabi, at kailan ito inilimbag. Kung na naipaabot ito sa kaalaman ng mga constituents na dapat nakakaalam ng, uh, ng ordinansa dahil ito ay may penal sanctions. Common sense naman, no? D dapat lang naman talagang alam natin dahil uh, how can these ordinances guide our co conduct? How can we observe whatever these ordinances are imposing for us to do or not do when we do not know kung ano man yun, di ba? And as for the substantive requirements, uh, nandiyan yun dapat hindi siya lumalabag sa constitution or any statute. It must be fair. It must not be oppressive. It must be impartial or not discriminatory. It cannot prohibit but may regulate trade and must be general and consistent with public policy. Uh, sa panahon ngayon, ito yung mga public policy concerning uh, measures to combat uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And it must not be unreasonable. Doon sa huli, yung, yung dapat reasonable siya, tanongin natin lagi, does the desirability of the ends sanctify any and all means for their achievement? Kaya yung mga ordinances na halimbawa nagbab nagbabawal ng or nag impose ng, for example, 24-hour lockdown, providing only for window hours when people can come out of their houses to access essential goods and services. For me, that's uh, defeating the very purpose of the ordinance because people will swarm to the places all at the same time during the window hours. Kaya dapat talaga araling maigi ng mga sanggunian uh, yung, uh, yung kanilang mga ordinansa. Kung maabot ba nito at may direct ang kinalaman siya doon sa objective. And as to the constituents, marami kaming natatanggap ng mga, uh, mga katanungan isinasangguni sa amin sa NUPL. Ang tanong nila lagi, what they can do as citizens? Sabi namin, lagi naman dapat bukas ang communication lines between citizens and uh, uh, the LGU officials concerned dahil uh, uh, lahat naman ng uh, yung feedback mechanism ay talagang gumagana kung papayagan yung mga tao na magpahayag ng kanilang uh, feedback o yung, yung komentos sa kung ano yung mga pinapatupad na sa lugar. Next slide, please. Yan. Uh, you can see photos of the uh, yung photos sa kaliwa, yan, yan si former anak pawis representative Ariel Casilao na pumunta doon sa Bulacan nung, nung hinarang inaresto mga relief volunteers ng tulong anak pawis at sagip kanayunan. This was the 
this was the time when uh, I don't know the name of the PNP official was berating him and the organization for forwarding their agenda raw. Yung, at niredtag pa sila kasi daw yung, yung dala nilang mga material bukod sa mga relief uh, goods, relief packs, ay subversive materials. Pero ano ba yung mga subversive materials di umano na ito? Mga uh, old issues, past issues ng Pinoy Weekly, which is an alternative news publication. And I think uh, there was also a, a publication from an artist group advocating for genuine agrarian reform. At ang nilalaman ng mga publication ay information about uh, paano makaiiwas sa COVID-19, paano makaiiwas sa pagkalat nito, at syempre, komentaryo kung paano tinutugunan ng gobyerno ang krisis tungkol dito. And there was uh, misinformation about uh, the group. Sabi ng, ng, I think this was uh, published in PIA or PNA, wala raw silang uh, sapat na authority to go out of the house, a house uh, out of their houses to participate in this um, activity. Pero malinaw na meron silang food pass at ang nature ng kanilang gawain ay to engage in relief mission. So clearly, walang violation ng Bayanihan to heal as one act uh, dahil meron sila, nag, nag uh, comply naman sila with guidelines about uh, conducting relief operations at wala rin violation ng Section 9E of RA-11332. Next slide, please. Yan. For practical tips, kapag tayo naman yung naging biktima ng karapatang pantao, we encourage everyone to document uh, the incident by writing it down or reducing it into a statement and also taking the statements of witnesses preserving all evidence that you have, including medical records, if the incident involved uh, you being hurt uh, physically or you sustaining physical injuries, mahalaga yan kasi maaring magamit na uh, ebidensya, hindi lamang sa kapag kayo ay nag-file na ng counter charge against the violators, but also as evidence in your defense uh, when criminal charges push through against you. Okay, so now I will, uh, I will now go to the next part of my presentation. This concerns one of the freedoms that we hold dear, freedom of expression, speech, and the freedom of the press. You can see from the slide, uh, this is a passage from a case, Chavez versus Gonzalez, describing what uh, these freedoms are. Collectively, these are the freedom for the thought that we hate, no less than for the thought that agrees with us. Uh, Pare-pareho naman tayo ng tinatamas ang karapatan ng mga trolls sa mga DDS. Well, trolls, debatable, pero yung mga, you know, yung mga uh, lagi nating nakakadebate sa social media tungkol sa ating mga opinion sa politika, we all enjoy uh, this, uh, all entitled to the same freedoms, to the same rights. So kahit na hindi tayo sang-ayon sa sinasabi nila, to the point na minsan nag pa tayo, uh, ipaglalaban pa rin natin dapat yung karapatan nila na sabihin yun. You can see from the photos, uh, Bambi Beltran, uh, the Cebu-based artist who was arrested for a sarcastic post in, I think, Facebook or Twitter where she described uh, a CTO in Cebu City as the epicenter of the universe because uh, prior to that, the city health officer declared that the, the entire population of that CTO is uh, presumed to have already been uh, infected by COVID-19. So wala namang masama sa sinabi niya. If anything, she was uh, trying to draw attention to the response e or relief efforts doon sa lugar na marami nang apektado. Yung litrato naman sa kanan, that's Joshua Molo, the 20-year-old um, editor-in-chief of the UE Don, which is the uh, school publication of the University of the East, who was made to, vid, uh, to publicly apologize on video for his uh, political posts on Facebook on complaints of his former teachers in high school. Kahit na wala naman siyang nilalabag at nagpapahayag lang naman siya ng kanyang sa loob din. Uh, next slide, please. Looking at Article 3 or the Bill of Rights of the Constitution, papansin natin, negatibo yung pagkakasaad sa batas. 
no law shall be passed abridging the freedom of speech, of expression of the press, so that for the, for the government to respect and uphold this right, all it has to do is nothing. Thus, prior restraint and subsequent punishment of speech and expression are prohibited. Limitations were carved out, uh, out of necessity, but these are rather narrow, specific, and well-defined uh, limitations uh, pertaining to the right to privacy, the honor and reputation of persons, national security, the fair administration of justice. So yes, these freedoms are not absolute, but censoring or punishing speech is, should not be uh, so easy to do you know, under any circumstance because it is a preferred right high up in the hierarchy of rights. Mataas ang pagtingin sa karapatan sa malayang pamamahayag. It is considered an exalted uh, right with preferred status. Hindi natin kailangan ipaliwanan kung gaano kahalaga ang karapatan na ito. Now, what is prior restraint? It is any law or official act that requires some form of permission to be had before publication can be made. Pwede lang gawin ito on four categories of speech. Only four categories of speech may be subjected to prior restraint or yung censorship per se. Ano yan? Yan yung obscenity or pornography, false advertising, advocacy of imminent lawless action, and danger to national security. All other expressions, tandaan natin, are not subject to prior restraint. Sa mundo nang dapat hindi basta-bastang magagawa ang censorship. Um, any such prior restraint on unprotected expression, kahit na unprotected expression yan, must hurdle a high barrier. Ayan yung tinatawag natin strict scrutiny. The prior restraint is presumed unconstitutional. At yung gobyerno meron siyang mabigat na burden of proving that the constitutionality of the prior restraint. So the courts have to weigh in first before censorship can take effect. They will first have to subject to strict scrutiny any government action imposing prior restraint on unprotected uh, expression. It has to see first if there is a compelling state interest and prior restraint is necessary to protect such state interest. In such a case, the prior restraint shall be narrowly drawn. Kasing kitid lang ng kung ano ang kinakailangan ng mga sirkonstansya. Only to the extent necessary to protect or attain the compelling state interest. So dito na pumapasok yung lagi natin naririnig. Ito yung tawag natin clear and present danger clear and present danger test. The expression restrained or to be restrained must present a clear and present danger of bringing about a substantive evil that the state has a right and duty to prevent. And such danger must be grave and imminent. Ano ba to? Ano bang mga dangers to? The public safety, public morals, public health, or any other legitimate public interest. But there's always a question of degree and proximity. Not only must it be serious, it must also be imminent. So, ang laging tanong sa amin dyan, yun bang paggamit ng hashtag Aus Duterte, uh, nagbabiolate sa clear and present danger test, it's no, uh, yan ba ay pwede namin sabihin, yan ba ay protected speech. It is protected speech because it does not bring about any clear and present danger. Lalo na ngayon, nakakulong tayo sa ating mga tahanan. Hindi naman uh, or kaya tayo ay nagpost ng Aus Duterte sa Twitter o kaya sa Facebook, ay lalabas na yung mga mamamayan para sa lakayin ng Malacanang. Uh, wala yung tiyatawag nating immediacy, wala yung tiyatawag nating degree o yung proximity uh, noong danger sa, sa seguridad ng Estado. Next slide, please. Now, what about subsequent punishment? Ito na yung mga nababalitaan nating ikinakaso sa mga lehitimong expression ng uh, opinion. Now, subsequent punishment seeks to remedy uh, what is uh, considered abuse of speech. And dyan yung makikita niyo, criminal defamation that can either be libel, or sa panahon ngayon, kalimitan cyber libel. Civil defamation, civil defamation, ito yung, yung action for damages para dun sa uh, pagpigil sa uh, pag-exercise mo ng constitutional right to free expression and for the press to publish there's also the, uh, these crimes against national security, such as inciting to rebellion and inciting to sedition, and crimes against public order, the unlawful use of means of publication. Contempt of court is also included as uh, among uh, these measures under subsequent punishment. And of course, Section 6F now, RA 11469, uh, na, na nadaanan natin kanina about false information. Uh, 
quickly lang, ano ba tong mga crimes against national security? Kasi familiar naman na tayo dun sa libel, yung paninira uh, sa kapwa. Uh, inciting to rebellion and insurrection, ito yung without taking arms or being in open hostility ag against the government, inciting others to the execution of uh, the acts of rebellion or insurrection by means of speeches, proclamations, writings, inciting to sedition naman, yung inciting others to the accomplishment of the acts constituting sedition by means of speeches din yan, o kaya yung, yung pag-publish daw ng mga libels against the Republic or any of the duly constituted authorities. I think the North Zagaray 7 uh, are facing charges of inciting to sedition. Kahit naman, uh, wala naman, klaro naman na wala naman silang ganitong uh, layunin nung sila ay tumungo doon para mamigay ng ayuda sa mga mahihirap na magsasaka ng North Zagaray Bulacan. Now, uh, under crimes against public order, there is this crime under Article 154 of the Revised Penal Code which is the unlawful use of means of publication and unlawful utterances. Ito yung tinatawag natin fake news proper by means of printing or any other means of publication shall publish or cause to be published as news any false news which may endanger the public order, uh, encourage disobedience to the law or to the duly constituted authorities or praise, justify or extol any act punished by law. Uh, kung makikita nyo, mas, mas uh, naro ito kasi ang pinaparusahan lang dito yung pinapalabas as fake news. Whereas under Section 6F, uh, yung uh, Bayanihan to Heals 1 Act, um, pinaparusahan yung false information mismo. So any false information, mas malawak yung kanyang scope. Now what about subjudice and what about contempt? What about contempt of court? Ito yung pinaparusahan under Section 3 of Rule 71 of the Rules of Court. Ito yung any abuse or any unlawful interference with the processes or proceedings of a court not constituting direct contempt. Ipig sabihin away from uh, the court while it is um, conducting a hearing. Ito yung mga improper conduct tending directly or indirectly to impede, uh, obstruct, or degrade the administration of justice. Mahalaga naman dito, bago ka masubject sa contempt of court, whether you cause the, or the delay uh, in the rendering of judgment, na pigilan mo ba yung ukom sa paggawa ng tungkulin nito, yung bang criticism and public reaction na nailimbag uh, within the bounds of proper debate, uh, naglikha ba ito ng violent protest, no? such that uh, the, the courts were no longer able to discharge their duties. Now, on under, I mentioned earlier that I would go back to this, 6F, Section 6F of RA 11469. I find this problematic and unconstitutional because it is overbroad, meaning it uh, prohibits even uh, innocent acts. No, yung kasama dyan, nasasakop dyan yung mga, yung mga speech or expression na lehiti mo naman. And if we look at the, at, if we look at the definition, having no valid or beneficial effect on the population and are clearly geared to promote chaos, panic, anarchy, confusion, and fear. I fear for those who will merely share um, such false information without knowing that they are not uh, true or accurate. Paano kung mukha talaga siyang totoo, di ba? Hindi niya alam na fake yung sinishare niya. Or even uh, after verification, uh, the person found it to, to have a color of truth and uh, thought that it would be his or her duty to inform the public about it. So I don't think that uh, the public should be made to account for honest mistakes to the point of suppression. That creates a chilling effect on our exercise of this freedom. And also, who will say when I, whenever an information or false information has no valid or beneficial effect, who will say that it, is, that it is clearly geared to promote chaos, panic, anarchy, confusion, or fear? Di ba yung mga otoridad lang? Only the uh, authorities. So, nagagamit talaga ito bilang sandata uh, para busal, busalin ang uh, uh, mga mamamayan sa kanilang uh, pagsasalita at pagbibigay uh, ng puna sa ating pamahalaan. So, uh, that ends my uh, presentation. Uh, sana ay nakatulong may mga 
uh, napulot kayo. I will be glad to answer your questions later during the open forum. I think uh, meron naman tayong chat box no, for this uh, uh, for this uh, for these questions. You can fill them in in our chat box and will be forwarded to us. Salamat. Thank you very much, Attorney Josa Dainla, for a very insightful discussion on the gener general human rights situation in the time of COVID-19 lockdown. And now, to talk about um, the situation of women political prisoners or women human rights defenders who were arrested and jailed for defending human rights in the time of COVID-19, um, let us listen to Ms. Sharon Kabusao, former political prisoner, and member of Kapatid, families and friends of political prisoners to give us a discussion on the situation of women political prisoners. Ms. Sharon Cabusao. Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, I would like to start off by uh, kicking off some data uh, about the situation not only of political prisoners but also of the non-political prisoners in Philippine jails. Um, so that gives you a better idea as to the basis for calls by Kapatid and other uh, organizations for the tem at least temporary release of uh, many uh, prisoners, both charged with political and non-political offenses. The International Committee, uh, the ICRC, you know, the International um, uh, Committee of the Red Cross, puts the number of uh, Philippine jails at 467 with about 534% congestion rate. We have about 100, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, about 186 uh, total number of prisoners in the whole country. Uh, this you can see the picture that's, being, uh, that's on your screen is the picture of a detention cell at the Manila City Jail. No? Uh, I think they are supposed to have a social activity, but since there's no space, so they also do it inside the cell. Anyway. Anyway, so at the 534 congestion rate, what does it mean? Um, according to international um, uh, human rights standards, every prisoner should be accorded at least four meters of space within the person. But in the Philippines, what we have is um, at the 534 congestion rate or percent congestion rate, we have about five to six people sharing the same space that is supposed to be allotted to only one person. And I think this uh, data is even kinder because there are uh, jails in, in, the, in the Philippines, the one that I had been to, for example, at the um, Taguig City Jail, um, the prisoners have, you know, they would, we would just sit side by side. Ganun ka, ganun ka dense, ganun ka congested yung person na yon. So, I, I would say that about four meters would be holding around six to seven persons. And that's that's for the whole day, no? There's very limited space for moving around. So you can just imagine that it was a COVID pandemic when social distancing is a key um, approach or strategy to avoid infections, social distancing is simply impossible in such situations. Okay. And other than the problem of social distancing is the problem also of the mediocre social services, uh, especially health services inside our prisons. Um, at the time that I was uh, imprisoned at the Taguig City Jail Female Detention Center, and I don't think there's been any change since then, uh, we have only about one doctor for the entire national capital region uh, jails of the Bureau of Jail Management and Penology. So it is very difficult if you are sick to be having a doctor attending to you uh, and it, it, it really happens that uh, there are cases even among the female prisoners um, just dying you know, inside the prison without having any medical attention. Uh, because of this uh, limitation. And then you can also imagine the very mediocre food and nutrition that um, prisoners receive uh, generally you know, inside our cells. So that is the basic situation of many um, uh, persons deprived of liberty or persons behind bars. So now you have the COVID pandemic. What do you do? Okay. 
And from, from this general data on the uh, prisoners, I also would like to share some data about the political prisoners in the, uh, in the country. You know? As of March 2020, according to Karapatan, the Human Rights Alliance, there are about 600, more than 600 political prisoners in the country, 100 of whom are women. And among these women political prisoners, we have someone like Reina Nasino, who is seven months pregnant. We have Gian Perez, who is stricken with leprosy. We have Moreta Alegre, who is 72 years old. Um, she is a victim of land grabbing um, and uh, was wrongly convicted, along with her husband and son, of murder. And Moreta also is uh, hypertensive. So among these are women who are sick, elderly, or both. Uh, this is Moreta Alegre. She is a farmer from Negros. And the one that you see on the right wearing the purple shirt is Cleofe uh, Fernandez, who is also um, suffering from hypertension. She's old, also around 60 plus or 70 plus years old. So this is the situation of uh, many political women political prisoners in the country. No? Um, political prisoners in the first place were imprisoned because of their political beliefs. They have been falsely, falsely charged um, with uh, common crimes so as to hide the uh, reality of, um, of a political dissent in the country. So in, in April, so because of the concern of many families of political prisoners that have been expressed early on in the period of the even prior to the, to the outbreak, no, to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, families have already expressed apprehension over the condition of uh, many political prisoners. Uh, even, I'm sure you've heard about um, Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights herself, uh, calling for uh, on state leaders to consider the situation of... Um, of a people behind bars, and especially also to give priority to the release of uh, political prisoners, people who were, or individuals who were arrested on the basis of their political beliefs, or those who were arrested without sufficient legal basis. So we filed a petition sometime uh, the first week of April. Um, this uh, covers, uh, the petitioners were uh, 22, political prisoners, men and women, including my husband, Adelberto Silva, who has a heart condition, and also including Reina Nasino, the pregnant woman political prisoner, and Gian Perez, the woman stricken with uh, leprosy. So we filed a petition, at least for a temporary release with the Supreme Court of the Philippines, of uh, these 22 political prisoners who have uh, documented medical conditions. Um, while, uh, while the petition was mainly about um, the 22 political prisoners, it also called for compassion in the case of non-political uh, detainees who are first-time and low-level offenders uh, and those who do not pose um, a threat or risk to public uh, safety for the Supreme Court to consider also releasing them, especially the poor and the indigent who cannot um, who are supposed to be out in jail already, but just cannot pay um, uh, the bail um, the bail bonds, so have remained in prison. Um, and sometime um, a, a week after the Office of the Solicitor General, uh, the same office which um, ordered the National Telecommunications uh, Commission to suspend ABS-CBN, um, uh, filed its um, opposition to the petition filed by the 22 political prisoners, uh, basically summing up their opposition uh, on three grounds, no? the most important of which is that um, they um, were, or the, the Office of the Solicitor General was saying that the 22 political prisoners constitute um, high risk or a flight uh, risk political prisoners, they, are, they have been accused of being terrorists, etc. And uh, while it was acknowledging the dangers being posed by the COVID pandemic, it says also that um, said Lex Duralex, the law 
may be harsh, but it is the law. But the problem basically with this argument is that while it quotes, you know, uh, or it professes to be uh, sticking uh, or adhering to the basic uh, tenets and principles of law, it has also prejudged, you know, pre um, prejudged the, uh, the cases of the 22 political prisoners who are still undergoing trial by saying that they are not worthy of uh, being released even on humanitarian considerations because implicitly saying that they are guilty of the charges that have been leveled against them. So we are still waiting for the decision of the Supreme Court about this petition. Uh, we have been receiving or reading uh, news reports that there are about, I think, nine to 10,000 that have already been released from late March to early April. But um, we have, Kapatid has been asking for um, transparency in the releases that are being made. You know, we would like to see, I think the public deserves um, to see the list of prisoners that are being considered for release uh, by the Supreme Court and by the Bureau of Pardons and uh, Parole, um, precisely because of past uh, uh, experiences uh, in, in, the, in Philippine jails about uh, controversies no, regarding the release of uh, controversial cases of prisoners. Um, to date, there has only been one political prisoner a woman who has been released uh, during this time of the COVID pandemic. But her case, um, uh, she was released simp uh, also because she has long served her sentence and she has also um, posted uh, bail you know, for the remaining uh, uh, case that she is charged with. Um, we have been there, we have been uh, calling out, we have been, we are very concerned for the safety and health of our beloved uh, family members who are being in prison or held in detention, uh, whom the Duterte government still uh, refuses to acknowledge the, um, the basis or the validity or the moral grounds for the release on humanitarian, uh, for humanitarian reasons of our political, of our political uh, prisoners. Um, especially because we have also been reading reports um, and receiving also some uh, 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 stories, no? The family members are receiving stories of um, inmates getting sick inside the jails but since there is no there are no there's no mass testing that's being done you know um they can just die without um knowing whether they um they were covid positive um and uh and there are still uh, political uh, political and even non-political prisoners that we understand are also uh, still sick, you know, up to this day, such as in the case of a political prisoner, uh, Tatay Dario Tumada, who has been um, um, experiencing um, or has been sick for many weeks now, you know, but we have no idea exactly um, what he is sick of because no mass testing is being done. So, um, Right now, we are still waiting for the decision and uh, the families of the political prisoners have written to the Supreme Court. Uh, Gabriela uh, has also written to the um, uh, Department of Justice, uh, which oversees the, the, um, the Bureau of Pardons and Parole for them to consider, in particular, the cases of Moreta Alegre and Lilia Bukatkat, another elderly who is uh, still in prison. Um, both have been falsely charged, accused and charged of crimes that they did not commit. Um, Moreta Alegre is a farmer from Negros whose uh, land was uh, grabbed by an influential and powerful person in the place. And uh, instead of, instead of um, uh, and, and, and the, the family of Moreta Alegre was charged with murder after one of the uh, employees of the land grabber was killed, but 
but the case of prospered even as the wife of the victim uh, wanted to file an affidavit of desistance because she believed that Moreta and her family had nothing to do with the death of her husband. But her case has dragged on and she has served a prison, uh, a prison uh, term for about uh, 10 years, I think, and she has five more years um, uh, in her sentence to be served. But she has been on good conduct ever since uh, she was in prison. And she's one of the persons, and she's 72 years old, and she's one of the persons, one of the um, uh, political prisoners that we really hope would the, the judges of the Supreme Court would find the heart to release no? uh, during the COVID pandemic. And also in the case of Reina Nasino, a very young, but not right now very pregnant woman, who uh, was also an urban poor organizer prior to her arrest. Um, I think it is her first time to, to be pregnant. And so we know that um, she is detained at the Manila City Jail, which, has, which is one of the really overcrowded prison facilities for women in the country. And then, of course, the case of Gian Perez, who is stricken with leprosy. Um, she's not a... She's not a high-risk um, uh, prisoner. Uh, she was just a caretaker uh, when she was uh, arrested. She was a caretaker for um, Cleofe Fernandez. And uh, uh, Gian Perez has been trying to medicate herself, uh, um, you know, because leprosy can be contagious. So it's really also um, quite a problem for many of those with whom she shares a prison space. And so we hope also that the Supreme Court judges will find it in their hearts to um, release uh, Gian Perez even on a temporary basis or to put her on hospital arrest. Any, any other alternative instead of being imprisoned in a highly congested uh, prison facility. So while waiting for the decision of the Supreme Court, we encourage, um, there has been a question I understand by one of the participants of the webinar um, asking about what they can do to help in the campaign to release political prisoners. Um, while we await the decision of the Supreme Court, um, I think it will be very important for organizations and individuals to write the Department of Justice, to write uh, Malacan Yang, um, um, asking that they consider to release these uh, political prisoners and expedite also the release of non-political prisoners, especially poor women who are only first-time or low-level offenders and uh, who do not pose a threat to public safety and who cannot afford to pay uh, bail money that they be released either on a one peso bail or on recognizance. So I think it will be useful if we will um, or helpful if we will strengthen the public calls um, for the release of uh, these prisoners, even on a temporary basis, on humanitarian grounds. A call that is also supported even by the United Nations itself, and also that has also been heeded and done already by, um, uh, by uh, other governments including that of the US, Canada, I think Australia, Iran, um, Indonesia, and some other countries who have released uh, prisoners and some of them political prisoners um, by the hundreds or I think by the thousands even um, to prevent the, their own jails from becoming ticking time bombs uh, during this COVID pandemic. So I will probably just end my presentation here and will be entertaining questions during the open forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sharon Kabusao, for, for that very insightful um, sharing on the situation of not only women prisoners, political prisoners, but um, the jail situation right now in the Philippines. Um, for our next speaker uh, to discuss um, the other impacts of um, human rights violations and other um, challenges that the women, uh, the women sector are confronted with, 
uh, under the uh, community enhanced quarantine and COVID-19. May we call on Ms. Cham Perez of Center for Women's Resources. Ms. Cham. Um, thank you, Ed. So, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, my task um, this afternoon is to show briefly um, what are uh, some of the other uh, rights violations that women are um, experiencing even before the pandemic and um, violations that uh, exacerbated uh, in the time of um, the pandemic. Uh, so we have seen that uh, the unprecedented public health crisis and how the government is responding to this. Um, we have seen uh, more of a militaristic approach rather than medical solutions and economic solutions to the crisis. It unfolded in the context of many pre-existing challenges for women. So even before the pandemic, uh, there is already massive poverty, unemployment, lack of basic social services um, among women. Uh, and these challenges, as I've said before, it is being exacerbated um, and disproportionately impacts on women's enjoyment of their human rights, including their um, social, cultural, um, and economic rights, uh, especially amid the, the slow, incoherent, and uh, the mil militaristic response that we are seeing um, with the present administration. Uh, so maybe just to reiterate, uh, even before the pandemic, there are already 16 uh, million Filipino women who are economically insecure uh, and another 12 million women uh, who are at work but are impacted uh, at the time of pandemic and lockdown, impacted by displacement due to um, work stoppage, those who are in no work to pay scheme, or those who have lost their livelihood because um, the ECQ or the lockdown does not allow them to do their economic activities. Um, okay, so uh, based on the based on the last report of the uh, report to the uh, joint uh, Congressional Committee uh, of the Duterte administration, it says, it told Mabas no Monday, as many as 7.7 .7 million households, that is 43% out of the targeted 18 million households, uh, maliit nga yung uh, target na ito, have not received any government um, cash assistance. No? Uh, so what does what does it mean? So kapag um, they are not receiving any uh, any cash assistance from the government, so uh, simply put, there is um, the problem with access to to food. So even before uh, the pandemic, uh, the Philippines has ranked seventy. 70 yet out of the 117 countries uh, with a score of 20.1 and it says that um, the Philippines suffers from a level of hunger that is serious. That is according to the um, 2019 Global Hunger Index. No? Uh, yung kawalan ng access to government cash assistance, for example, uh, it further shrinks uh, the capacity of families of households to access food and other necessities. No? Uh, according to the FNRI uh, of the DOST, even before then ng pandemic, I 53.9% um, na ng households sa buong Pilipinas. Yung uh, yung food insecure, no? And to, to add to that, uh, yung proportion ng uh, nutritionally at risk uh, women or pregnant women ay nasa 20% or that is um, 
one in every five pregnant women, no? Uh, so, basically, uh, sa panahon ng pandemic, sa kawalan ng um, slow or lack, uh, lacking yung government assistance, um, yung basic right to food ng mga kababaihan ay violated, no? Uh, Next would be uh, women's access to to health. So last week we saw the news of the death of a woman who had just given birth after being rejected by six hospitals. No, a death which could have been avoided had there been available and accessible reproductive health services in place. No. Uh, we see this as a clear violation of one's right to life uh, and one's right to health. So while we, while we also recognize that our healthcare system is very much overwhelmed uh, with responding to COVID-19 and that much of the resources of the government are being uh, diverted to this, it does not mean that women's health can just be deprioritized especially uh, those critical healthcare services that uh, women need uh, the most. And with the current setup, as, as we know it, with the current setup uh, that the healthcare system in our country is highly privatized, the, um, the situation of women's loss of income due to work and uh, livelihood stoppage resulted to a further decrease in their capacity to access the um, the available health care uh, and I think this will be um, my my last point here um, is uh, the, the violation of women's right to be free from violence so in the la latest report, uh, to the Joint Congressional Oversight Committee, we saw that there are uh, more than 1,000 cases of crimes committed against women and children. So this is this translates to 28 cases per day. So since the implementation of the ECQ in March 14 or 15, no, uh, and we believe that this is grossly underreported, no? even without the pandemic and lockdown. According to the National Demographic and Health Survey, only 3 in 10 uh, women who experience abuse would seek help or report to authorities. And during the pandemic and lockdown, seeking help or reporting to authorities will be more difficult uh, especially when women can't even go out of their houses or um, when she doesn't have access to communication or technologies that would enable her to seek help. And especially uh, when um, mechanisms in uh, local governments or at the national government are not in place to ensure that women victims of vow, women and children victims of vow, have access to support services. Well, of course, there are women's organizations, NGOs, and other institutions that are extending um, their support in various ways, such as, um, for example, expansion of helplines and technology-based solutions uh, that include online and mobile platforms. I remember last time we had um, an online legal clinic and discussion on violence against women, but we, we still see that on the part of the government, there is a need to strengthen um, their response to ensure the protection of women and children from violence in time of pandemic. So these are just um, briefly some of the uh, women's rights that are, are uh, have been violated and continuously being violated in time of the pandemic. And uh, what we want to see is that the government, we, we are urging the government to put women and people's rights at the center of its um, 
COVID-19 response, so rather than um, the more militaristic solutions or more suppression of women and people's voice, um, I, I think women and people's rights should should be at the center of the response. So I'm going to, to stop there uh, and excited to hear um, some of your questions. Thank you, Eds. Thank you, Cham, for um, for that sharing. Uh, indeed, it is truly a challenging time for women, especially those in the marginalized sectors. And it is also um, a challenge for the national and local governments. Um, indeed, it is the challenge of mitigating the impacts of COVID-19 is not only um, a test of efficiency, but also a test of character for all government leaders. And for almost two months, based on the presentations and sharing today, um, this pandemic perfectly bared how the government has built its, its regime for the past four years, which is through fear and repression. And to give us a more detailed picture of how the government sowed fear at this very critical time, when the public uh, needed support and protection, and it is imperative for the government to actually provide relief and aid. Uh, we invited women who courageously responded to the rising needs in the time of COVID-19 and who were likewise affected by lockdown and human rights violations. So this afternoon, we invited uh, a panel of reactors First reactor uh, will provide us a picture as to how Moro women and the Moro community in general has been affected by the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, may we call on Ms. Amira Lidasan, the Secretary General of Moro Christian People's Alliance. Ms. Amira? Hello. Yes. Yes, Ms. Amira, could you share to us um, ano ba yung mga nangyari sa Moro women and the Moro community in general after the implementation of enhanced community uh, quarantine in most places in the country? Okay, so I'll start by uh, giving data muna of the impact of COVID and uh, the policies no, na nilabas ng uh, local government unit at saka ng uh, um, uh, iba't ibang mga provinces here uh, at the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. So, as of May 5, uh, there are 10 confirmed um, cases of uh, uh, COVID-19 and then you have uh, uh, reported three deaths and uh, one recovered. And uh, for the past uh, weeks, uh, since walang lumalabas na mga new COVID cases, uh, the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao or BARM uh, declared uh, BARM as COVID-free. And then, um, nag-start na na magkaroon uh, na ma-implement ang uh, general uh, community quarantine from um, uh, enhanced community quarantine. Uh, doon na naglalabasan yung mga data that there were patients who were admitted in hospitals but it took how many days, no? 15 days at most or 10 days at most uh, to know that uh, th those uh, uh, patients were tested positive. No? This is because um, uh, for the past uh, April and, uh, March and April, uh, just like the rest of the Philippine uh, areas, no, um, Mindanao and uh, the BARM areas uh, did not have uh, or conducted mass testing. It's only now that we hear that a rapid um, testing are happening in some areas in Maguindanao and in some areas of uh, the BARM. So, um, uh, we all, in Mindanao, we only have one testing center recognized by the um, Department of Health, and that's in Davao. So imagine uh, the island provinces from Tawi-Tawi, Sulu, and uh, 
Basilan and the rest of the uh, provinces in uh, regions uh, in the whole of Mindanao, uh, all their um, uh, swabs have to be um, um, taken to Davao City uh, for testing. No, but uh, the Barm government um, uh, in the middle of April uh, gave a 1.4 billion one. 4 million, sorry, uh, um, fund for the Cotabato Regional Medical Center just so that they could buy the uh, PC, PCR no? and uh, they could start the testing uh, in some areas near uh, Cotabato City. So, um, uh, first is the Magidano province, no? but then the rest of the Barm areas, especially the island provinces, has to go directly also to uh, either in Sambuanga City or in, in Davao City where the uh, testing center is uh, most uh, recognized. So that's how uh, difficult the uh, situation is for, uh, and, and it's very premature you know, for local government agencies, especially uh, the Ministry of Health, to say that um, uh, the Bangsamoro areas are COVID-free now. And um, uh, one of the uh, epicenter of the Barm areas uh, is also in Lanao del Sur. No, medyo nakatakot sa area na yun because you know that um, Lanao del Sur has suffered uh, yung uh, Marawi siege uh, in 2017. But uh, three, uh, two years or three years after, I there's still most of the residents are still confined in uh, evacuation centers and uh, in um uh in permanent and uh, temporary uh, transitional uh, shelters no um uh, around marawi city and the boundaries no of uh, marawi city and lanao del sur um province province so um with that most of the uh, um, uh, evacuees have complained already that uh, uh, they are afraid, uh, they fear uh, a, a um, uh, spread of COVID-19 uh, in their area because of the proximity of the houses, they are all in evacuation centers, and because of the lockdown, it's very difficult for them to uh, have access to um, medical services that's inside Marawi City or uh, in um, uh, centers of uh, Lenao del Sur uh, municipalities. No? So it has been difficult also for them to get uh, um, uh, not only health services, but also uh, uh, food reliefs. No? Um, one of the families no, uh, that we have talked to have complained that uh, most of the evacuees are not prioritized in, uh, in, in their barangays because, because they are not uh, part of that barangay, but because uh, they are uh, placed there in transitional uh, centers, then uh, they don't know where to uh, um, ask no uh, immediate immediate help no although the the um, barm government has uh, released at least i think one 1.9 billion for um uh, relief no social economic relief for, for the people still there are uh, some families especially in the areas where uh, there are conflict uh, areas there's military operation and um, uh, declared lockdown in those areas. Um, they complain that uh, they don't receive this relief from the DSWD, you know, uh, the food relief, the food packs. You know. um, the social amelioration program, the BARM said that uh, they will distribute it by May 15. They're still um, um, arranging some of the uh, data for for uh, four piece uh, beneficiaries with four piece and beneficiaries uh, who are not included in the four piece program. Now the, the biggest problem that we have right now is that uh, um, most of the Moro areas are still uh, in conflict 
uh, um, uh, or uh, um, experiencing military operations. No, um, there was a relentless um, military drive by the armed forces of the Philippines since uh, the COVID uh, um, COVID time. No. Um, in Maguindanao, there's a 10-day military operation that um, um, displaced more than 200 families. Uh, in Sulu, uh, it's not only in the middle of April that we learned that there were military operations. Uh, the AFP have been bombing Patikul Sulu as early as uh, the first week of April. And we also have uh, reports that... Um, uh, the government is saying that they are also hunting ISIS uh, members uh, in Lanao del Sur. Now, the families and the, the uh, residents of these areas complain that uh, um, there's more money or budget for military operations for the use of this heavy artillery um, against uh, these groups instead of diverting it, these funds to uh, the health services. So these are the um, um, main problem that we're facing uh, in this community. And more and more human rights um, issues you know, uh, were reported to us about uh, displacement and about um, 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 people being, uh, or houses being destroyed, communities being destroyed, and people are not, um, cannot uh, just go to their, go back to their communities to harvest no, and, and uh, because the uh, uh, military might um, uh, uh, mistake, mistake them for being an Abusayaf, an ISIS, or um, other, or BIF. No? So that has been uh, a big problem for um, uh, most of the uh, communities here. Now, uh, as to the checkpoints, there, um, most of the cities no, uh, in, in Mindanao, but specifically in Cotabato City, they have been very strict in their enhanced community quarantine um, um, implementation to the extent that uh, it's not just the pass. It, it, you need the work pass. You need the a quarantine pass, but uh, if if they don't see you um, uh, wearing a face mask, they would apprehend you. They would immediately file cases against you, uh, inquest, and then uh, you're asked to pay ten thousand for bail for each. You no, know? now these are poor people. In one instance in Maguindanao, um, one of the ten people uh, were arrested. Uh, uh, two including two minors, they were uh, or Tidorais or the uh, indigenous people of Tidorais. And um, they are in the uh, areas because uh, they wanted to uh, find no, um, um, uh, relief no, for their um, uh, family. But then they were apprehended at the checkpoint, not wearing a mask. So they were immediately uh, proceeded to the uh, jail, uh, imprisoned, and then um, uh, filed uh, cases violating the Bayanihan law. So these are the things that um, we uh, deeply regret because uh, uh, most of those being arrested are people who are actually looking uh, for food to eat and uh, looking for odd jobs no, that uh, would help uh, their family um, have food to eat, no. So that, those are the things that uh, we also uh, would want to um, uh, to highlight. How can we how can we help these people who doesn't uh, have lawyers who doesn't uh, in uh, we cannot um, immediately help them uh, as um, they were immediately apprehended, no. So these are the things that add to the burden of the people, you know, of the uh, uh, poor people. You know, they for uh, for nearly two months they don't have food. They have to um, uh, line up, you no, know, uh, to to make sure, you no, know, that uh, they have the relief. And uh, some of them, most of the people, uh, most of the Moro people now are. Uh, fasting under uh, for a month, no, because it's uh, Ramadan, 
and uh, we are being made to line up uh, in in centers so that we could get the social amelioration program. We thought it was decentralized, but no, it was centralized in in some schools, no, in in big spaces. So just imagine for a whole day uh, under heat, no, of the sun. Uh, our fasting Moro brothers and sisters are lining up just to get uh, for how many hours just to get uh, uh, relief. And uh, that has been um, uh, uh, one of the things that our brothers and sisters, Moro brothers and sisters are facing. So those are the, the things that I can um, uh, share for this. And I thank you for inviting uh, us, Bangsamoro, for this sharing. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Amira. And uh, for now, we would like to call our second um, reactor, Ms. Dabet uh, Panelo, Secretary General of National Union of Journalists of the Philippines and one of the 11,000 um, employees who may be affected by ABS-CBN shutdown. Ms. Dabet? Hello. Good afternoon. And thank you for the... Invitation. Do I have to start my video? No, not anymore. Do I have to? Not necessarily, yes. Not necessarily. Okay. So, uh, thank you for uh, for this invitation and for the opportunity to discuss the our situation right now. Of course, um, freedom of expression and press freedom. Uh, we say, as we said in our. Uh, World Press Freedom Day statement has been a casualty of uh, the COVID-19. You know, officers down the line of authority have found ways to weaponize government directives against targeted groups, and among these are activists and journalists. After, can I just run down no, the cases after the president announced the Luzon quarantine, the in the uh, IATF told journalists to secure accreditation from PCOO. Of course, um, we are always against uh, regularization. And the task force said that only those with the IATF ID, accreditation ID, may be exempted from the home quarantine. And they were the only ones who were actually allowed to cover um, outside. So most of us uh, including me, I don't have the ID, so I work from home. Media groups, of course, protested the accreditation requirement because this is an add-on mechanism of uh, bureaucratic control. In fact, in some uh, in some provinces, for example, in Camarines Norte, um, there was a case where uh, those there are there were uh, local journalists who were not given the ID and when they were trying to cover um, in the barangays, in the villages, uh, they were not allowed to cover. So uh, it is also a way of um, hampering uh, press freedom. Um, of course, uh, as mentioned by the speaker earlier, the Bayaninan law had uh, measures of control, um, especially when they said that uh, uh, those who are uh, those who will be caught uh, purveying uh, fake news will be apprehended. Um, the most prominent case, of course, was uh, the filmmaker um, in uh, in Cebu who posted the satire, but um, was actually uh, arrested. Um, she was uh, arrested without warrant. Few hours later, after she posted that, uh, uh, the Philippine cyber crime law has also used to curtail freedom of expression in uh, social media during ECQ on March 27. Um, a teacher in General Santos was arrested also without warrant for uh, inciting to uh, sedition. And on April 6, Joshua Moldo uh, of the editor of the Don, I think, was mentioned earlier. 
um, was also threatened with a charge of uh, online libel because he, uh, he posted a comment about uh, government's poor response to the threat of uh, COVID-19. Uh, of course, on top of on top of all these, uh, there are threats and attacks on uh, press freedom. Um, from January 1, 2019 to April 2022, uh, we have documented uh, 60 reported incidents of threats and attacks against the press, including four journalists uh, who were killed. Um, this does not include the fifth who was killed on exactly on July. Uh, just uh, right after uh, an hour after uh, ABS CBN went on air, uh, signed off because of uh, the because it did not it was still a non franchise. So, of course, if we go there, um, before there was a threat, but of course, now the threat uh, we, we, we are facing the threat already because we channel two is not off the air of course um, and uh, um, most of uh, our employees haven't had a good sleep in the last few days uh, because of too much anxiety because we even if our bosses has told us that uh, have told us that uh, we will be getting our, our salaries for the next few months but of course after three months, if we're not given the franchise, um, what's in store for us? So definitely, uh, there will be a lot of jobs that will be affected, and um, everybody's really there to have anxiety attacks over over that fact. Of course, uh, again, on on top of what is happening right now, there is a red tagging. Um, uh, red tagging of NUJP and the red tagging of um, our members, uh, former former uh, officers. And um, of course, uh, we have the executive director of the Eastern Vista, Frenchie May Kung Trumpio, um, who is still uh, incarcerated up to, up to this day. And um, of course, we are still calling for her release. Uh, and Paula Espiritu of the of Nordis has been linked to the communist line by the military since 2020. And on different occasions in 2020, she was accused of being a member of the NPA. Um, of course, uh, the relenting, unrelenting attack against her has taken a toll on her emotional state and made her sick um, with wounds. So uh, of course, the freedom of expression has been casualty of the enhanced community argument. Uh, but this should not stop the media from doing its mandate, which is to report what is happening in the country and to continue to be the watchdog of society. So this has always been our call. Um, let us continue to report. Let us continue to do our job because the only way to assert our right to publish is to testify. So again, um, this is David Panelo of NUJP. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Ms. David Panello of um, Secretary General of NUJP and one of the 11,000 um, employees affected who may be affected by the abs cbn shutdown. And right now, we would like to call our last two um, reactors. And we would like to inform everyone that because there is so much data, there's so much information and stories that we need and we would want to share to our audience, we will be extending for a bit of 30 minutes so we can accommodate all your questions that you have submitted to us. Uh, and for our last two reactors, we would like to call um, two women who have been arrested under the enhanced community quarantine last May 1. Um, first is Gabriel, uh, from Gabriela National Office. She is one of the 10 relief volunteers arrested in Marikina City. And the other is um, Ms. Lucy Francisco, Gabriela Panay, one of the 42 human rights defenders arrested and detained in Iloilo City last May 1. We would like to call Ms. Dimpol Paz. 
Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hello. Magandang hapon sa lahat. So um sige bago ko simulan yung ano no yung actual na arrest sa amin nung May 1. So mag context lang ako ano yung nagaganap bago yun, bago yung pangyayaring yun. So uh, nakakapagbigay tayo ng serbisyo sa lugar sa community. So sa ang ang nandito naman ay yung Cure COVID Network Marikina City, Lingap Gabriela. At yung mga, yung Task Force, Ch Task Force Children of the Storm na ang pangunahing uh, na nandito naman ay yung mga Batibo teachers natin. So, nakapaloob sila doon. So, nasimula namin ito sa IBC, yung paglilip at pagbibigay ng services sa ma uh, Industrial Valley Complex Marikina mula March 17. So, nakapag-umpisang makapangalap ng tulong uh, sa mga nawala ng kabuhayan. Tapos, ang pangunahing naisip namin ay yung mga pedicab drivers. So, na mula pa nung ECQ ay pangunahing uh, dumadaing dahil tigil pasada sila. So, the, uh, later on, uh, nag-reach out sa atin yung isang uh, taga-babae ako network. So, nagbuo sila ng isang uh, network ng... Uh, para sa relief drive yung bayan niyang Marikenyo at Marikenya. So yung mga yung una nilang beneficiary ay itong mga uh, pedicab. So nagsimula na doon yung pagbibigay natin ng serbisyo uh, dahil nakita rin naman ng karamihan na maagap yung pagtugo natin sa pagbibigay ng serbisyo ay naibigay uh, nakapag uh, pangalap puli tayo ng para naman sa mga tricycle drivers. At nitong huli nga ay nakapangalap na tayo ng para sa mga jeep na drivers naman. Tapos, kasabay na nito ay yung araw-araw na nakusinang bayan sa iba't ibang barangay sa Marikina. So, sa bawat uh, relief operations, sa bawat relief operations at feeding ay nakakatulong yung Lingap at Cure COVID Network doon sa pagbibigay ng mga informasyon ano ba ang COVID-19 tapos ano uh, kadalasang ma, kung nasa komunidad kayo di kadalasang mga tanong ay tinggil sa social amelioration program o yung as, uh, ayuda so tuloy-tuloy yung pag-assist natin doon sa mga driver kung paano sila sasamahan at lalapit sa mga ahensya para makakuha ng ayuda. Tapos, in-explain din natin sa kanila dahil hindi nila alam ano yung kahalagahan nung uh, Marikina City COVID Testing Center na isinusulong ni Marikina Mayor Marcy Chodoro. E di, nagsasaga din tayo o uh, tayo din yung pangunahing nag nag educate sa kanila. Ano yung kahalagahan nun habang naka ang aming komunidad. So, naging sentro din kami dito sa community, no? Lalo na yung mga teachers dito. Uh, si Teacher Lita, si Teacher Kagawad Libidipo ng IBC. At pangunahin talagang nilalapitan kapag may mga abuso ng, kapo ng kapulisan ngayong panahon ng ECQ. So, is yung, ang mga kadalasang kaso dyan ay harassment. Uh, and then, ang uh, mas madalas ay agarang paghuli sa mga walang face mask, na walang konsiderasyon, bigla na lang isasakay sa mobile, wala man lang warning. So, yun. At iba pa, no? Then, later on, um, yung mga drivers na uh, na nandito ay naging volunteer na nung Cure COVID Network. Tuloy-tuloy silang lumahok at uh, kusang loob naman na, na, na nakikipa ag Tulungan sa atin no nagluto ng uh, pagkain para dun sa mga kapwa nila taong gutom, walang pinipili, basta nangangailangan at kasi yung ibinibigay na pagkain. No actually nung ano nga no, no nagkasunog sa Happy Land Tondo, itong mga driver, mga PUV, public utility vehicle o yung mga jeepney drivers pangunahin ay nag nagdonate dun sa nasunugan sa tondo. Nagbigay sila ng dalawang sakong bigas tapos pumunta mismo sa evacuation center at doon nag-eading. May mga documentation kami kaya lang hindi ko hindi ko lang maipakita ngayon. 
So, ito na, no, nung araw, niwan, halos mauubos na yung kinakain naming sopas. Sorry, ah, medyo nag, ah, ano ko. Tuloy ang, syempre, tuloy ang distribution din noon habang kumakain kami para doon sa pagpapakain. Syempre, hindi, hindi ito yung first time namin magpakain, no? Matagal na itong ginagawa. Almost magdadalawang buwan na mula pa nung nag-ECQ. So, alam naman namin yung mga protocol, mga social distancing, etc. Then, pagka ano namin, pagkalingon namin, biglang dumating yung mga pulis. Sinigawang kami, hinanapan ng ID, tapos agad naman namin binigay ni Teacher Dita kasi kami yung, yung kausap ng mga pulis, no? yung mga arresting officers. Sunod na hinanap naman yung permit namin kung mayroong ko koordinasyon ito sa barangay. Then definitely, meron naman kami permit galing sa barangay at kinikilala kami talaga doon na nagbibigay kami ng mga relief, nagpapakain. So agad namin ibinigay at pinakita sa kanila yon sumama ka um, ang sabi lang sa amin pagkabigay ng permit sumama kami no sumama kami dahil ipupunta kami sa barangay pero nagtatanong pa rin naman kami kung ano yung violation so wala silang masagot kasi ang bagit nila ay doon na lang namin malalaman ang aming kaso sa barangay mismo yun ah uh, pagkasakay namin hindi eh, syempre ito yung mga mga sa observation namin, no? Aware naman kami doon sa social distancing. Kaya nung pinapasakay kami sa mobile, sisiksik kami doon sa isang mobile kaming sampo. Di, nagbanggit na kami na walang social distancing, bakit kami isasakay dyan? Kaya, um, tumawag sila ng isa pang mobile. Then, asking din yung sinasakyan namin, di sumakay ako dun sa isang mobile, tinatanong sa amin kung bakit kami hinuli. So, yung nagsakay sa amin sa mobile, hindi alam bakit kami hinuli. So, hindi syempre, nag-explain kami sa kanila dun sa mga, nung, dun sa nasa mobile, eh, ang banggit lang sa amin, uh, sinakay lang naman kayo dito nila, ma'am, hindi namin alam kung ano ang kaso nyo. Ganun ang sabi sa amin. Tapos, mamaya-maya, nag sa Marikina, ano kami, headquarters police station kami dadalhin. Then, dumating kami doon, may mga pinapapirmahan, pero nag-refuse kami dahil wala naman kaming mga kasalanan. Tapos hindi nila ine-explain ano ang kaso namin. So halos dalawang oras ito, no, nag-aantay kami at inukulit nila kami na papirmahin sa isang papel, inaalam yung mga, mga detalye ng pangalan namin. Then hanggang sa siguro napilitan na rin sila, may lumabas yung arresting officer namin at sinasabi na isecure daw ang kaso namin. Pero walang specific na dahilan at detalye anong particular doon na ang nilabag namin. Yun. Then tinawag ako ng arresting officer eh, puposasan na daw kami. Doon na ako nag-umpisa syempre na ano, mag hysterical, umiyak na ako, sumigaw na ako. Kasi ang banggit ko sa kanila, edi syempre, hindi talaga krimen yung magpakain ng kapwa mo nagugutom. Then yung isang babae daw doon, ang banggit ni, ni Sena kasi ng uh, bayanihang Marikenyo Marikenya, di nagtawanan daw yung, bab, uh, yung mga tao. Dahil sabi ng polis, ay kulong kayo ngayon, magkainan kayo ngayon. So, yun pala yung pinagtatawanan nila. Bi, uh, Uh, hindi kami binigyan ng respeto bagkos ay uh, binastos kami ng harap-harapan nung umiiyak kami at pinuposasan kaming dalawa ni Tic Sherlita. So, nakaposas kaming dalawa. No? Walang social distancing. Kita nyo naman siguro sa mga photos. Uh, magkasama kami ni Tic Sherlita sa isang posas. Ganon din yung iba pa namin kasama. Dalawang tao sa isang postas, dinala kami sa amang kung saan nandoon ang mga COVID patient. Na-expose kami doon. Ang tangi lang naming daladala ay yung face mask na meron kami lahat. Si Tier Charlita, edi, alam naman naming lahat na meron si, meron, uh, siya ay cancer patient. Edi, sinabi din namin yun sa arresting officers. Tapos sinabi rin namin yun sa doktor mismo. Pero hindi pinapakinggan, walang konsiderasyon. At uh, isa pa, nung afternoon, walang, kahit nung in-X-ray kami, pinamedico legal kami, doon sa Amang Rodriguez, 
walang hindi din disinfect yung X-ray. Hindi x ray yan namin. So, walang walang ganun. <laughs> Tapos nung minamag shot din kami, uh, pinasuot kami ng damit na dilaw na sobrang dumi. Sa pilitang ipinasuot sa amin kasi nagre-refuse din ako dahil sobrang dumi talaga. Tapos sampung tao sa dalawang damit. Nahalata namang marami na rin gumamit dahil sobrang dumi. Mukhang hindi nila nilalaban. Tapos, uh, isa pa, niyayang kumain yung mga driver. Pinakain sa isang kasirola at isang kutsara. At salo-salo silang pito na nagsasalitan sa pagsubo habang nakaposas. Sinamantala, nung, sinamantala nila yung gutom ng mga driver dahil alam nilang um, maaga pa lang ay nag-aalmusal na kami nung hinuli nila kami. Uh, yung mga kapulisan, ano, mula doon sa inilatag ko, ay wala din talagang kaseryosuhan sa pangangalaga sa kalusugan, lalo na doon sa mga hinuhuli nila. Nagtanong pa nga kami bakit hindi nila uh, binigyan ng tigi isang mangkok at kutsara yung mga driver. Pero tinawanan lang kami ni Teacher Lita. So, after noon, eh di uh, ini-inquest na kami, Uh, nakapag-usap-usap kami dun sa mga driver eh. Nakapag-share sila yung ilang mga drivers na sinabihan sila, tinatanong magkano babayad sa inyo dahil daw may nakitang mga karton ng mga kahilingan nila na may nakasulat na free mass testing tsaka yung isang tatay dahil nung araw na yun ay dumadaing din sa amin. Uh, ibigay na daw yung ayuda, yung eksaktong nakalagay ay ayuda, ibigay na sa amin, pambilitang gatas ng anak ko. So, isa ito sa nakaka-prostrate at iniiyakan ko gabi-gabi dahil sinisikap ng mga tao na maging mabuti at kusang loob na tumutulong at nagluluto. Ngunit parang um, voluntaryo na nga nila itong ginagawa pero nila, nilalapastangan yung mga nagiging effort ng mga ito na tumulong. So, highlight doon sa binabanggit ko kanina, yung walang pagkilala sa karapatang pantao ng uh, mamamayan talaga. Ayun po. Uh, yun lang yung maishishare ko ngayon. Medyo hindi, ayun, medyo uh, yung ibang detalye pa ay hindi ko na ma, may detalye pa ngayon. May, hindi na ako komportable balikan. Sorry. So, maraming salamat sa inyo. Um, sige. Maraming salamat, Bimpol, uh, sa pagbabahagi noong karanasan. So, um, we have seen, no, there are uh, community organizations, women's organizations who are pulling their efforts uh, to augment the lack of government response to the pandemic. Pero ang um, sagot ay um suppression sa kanila but at at this point i'd like to thank dimpol at um uh cure covid network for the great work that that you are doing so uh salamat so at at this point uh gusto nating tawagin si uh Lucy Francisco ng Gabriela Panay para i-share naman ang karanasan uh nila doon sa uh, Hello. Magandang hapon sa lahat. Uh, na narinig ko ang mga experience ng ibang grupo, no, mga leaders ng ating organization na ganun rin ang na experience o bilang isang leader kababaihan sa mayigit tatlong dekada na sa Gabriela. Uh, before ko i-share yung kung anong nangyari sa amin sa April, as ah, May 1, uh, ng time na there was a COVID, ang um, ginawa namin ay nagpuo kami ng healthiness kasi concerned talaga kami sa security, sa life ng every kababaihan ng mga man. So yun ang ginawa namin, nag-campaign kami, nag-print ng mga materials, na thousands of these, yung campaign namin sa Uh, hindi ng organized area sa halos different communities and within uh, several 
provinces na sa Kapi, sa Atlan, pinadala at Bulgaria. So yung aming health team, sila yung nagka-campaign not only to fight COVID but to give awareness to the people pa paano mapangalagaan ang buhay at ma ma-insure na hindi ma-contaminate ng COVID. So ang nangyari, uh, nag-conduct kami ng mga community kitchen or tawag na nutritional food distribution. Ang isang group ng mga kabataan, pero the kabataan party list na nag-conduct ng kanilang uh, community kitchen or food distribution in Molo area had encounter harassment. You know what to do with them? Mismo ang police na nagpo-conduct ito ng mga kabataan ng uh, community kitchen or food distribution din haras. Uh, mga local barangay official pinagsabihan na hindi sila mag hindi sila ina-allow despite na de-practice what is to be done like with the face mask, social distancing, um, Hello? Hello? Uh, despite na ginagawa nila, pinapractice rin yung social distancing with face mask at may mga quarantine pass with ID to avoid some questioning pa sa kanilang presence to the communities where they are also uh, living. No? Because tinatap natin yung mga uh, leaders in the community. We also coordinate with the local officials. So, nangyari sa kanila, impag sila na yung kanilang uh, pinipiding ay mayroong COVID. It's the police who do it. So, ang ginawa namin, na-report namin ito sa Iliga City Mayor as part also of supporting his program to share food to the less privileged, underprivileged children, women, and the people who are in the press community. So what happened um, sa, uh, sa Bayan Muna, they also do the feeding program in the shorelines uh, covering the Molo and Arevalo districts. So, so it was led by Jory Portia, uh, coordinating with the local officials. So continuing yung mga feeding program na yung nangyari, may nag-monitor sa kanya at tinatanong sa community anong ginagawa. And then he identified who is the one leading. So they know that it was Jury Portia and on April 30, he was hunt and he was brutally killed with nine gunshot wounds and one of the hit is in his head, ensuring that he will not survive. So upon knowing kami early in the morning of April 30, nalaman namin na pinatay, pinaslang si Jury. So bilang leader, kasama mong leader at wala namang ginawa for his more than 40 years of serving the people, serving the overseas Filipino workers from the time even if he was out in the country, doing his mission for, the, for helping the poor, especially the urban poor and the veteran sectors, because he was assigned. Yon, siya ay Pinas na. So, ginawa namin ng May 1, uh, 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 sa pangunguna rin ng bayan, sa bayan ng Gabriela, we agreed to launch a condemnation, a indignation uh, caravan. So, we, we assembled in the Haro Plaza, but with the awareness to everyone who will attend, bring your mask, bring your quarantine pass, ID, ensure the physical distance, and of course, we have placards. Ayong streamer na may mayroong picture ni Jury Portia na we demand justice for him because he was brutally killed. So there are police, we made a dialogue. Dialogue kami kung pwede kami payagan, we discuss to him in a way that maintindihan niya yung, yung damdamin ng pamilya na kasama namin, yung anak ni Jury Portia at saka yung lawyer rin na with us who will assist for the legal uh, questioning and, and the, doing his lawyering work with us and sabay siya sa inaresto. No? So in our negotiation, hindi naman kami pinakinggan. Uh, there was riot police and just they declared na lahat kami ay arrested. 
So our lawyer is asking, ano yung violation? Ano yung violation? I am part of the negotiating team and asking, anyway, where if you will not grant us, we're going to disperse. Ihatid na namin yung bawat uh, miyembro namin na nandito para kung hindi naman talaga kami papayagan, ay uh, we will abide. And all our negotiation, walang disobedience, we do it in a way that uh, civilized, and hinahanapan kami ng permit. So we told him that this is May 1, araw na manggagawa, at araw na pinas lang ang aming kasamahan bilang kasama namin na nakikibaka para sa interes ng mamamayan, interes ng kababayan, at ng susunod natin generasyon. So it, we just want to give justice and let the, uh, a simple uh, lighting of candle in the area where he was healed and putting in flowers. Then we will disperse. Pero hindi kami pinakinggan. Uh, the officer, the station commander announced that you are all arrested. Of course, there are some of our colleagues who were able to proceed, nakapalag, but we were left, the 42 of us. So, nang dinakit kami, dinalak kami sa Haro Police Station, of course, we suffer heat. Ang dami naman namin, so walang maupuan, naka, nakaupo sa baldosa, syempre delayed ang amin food. And for people who had eh, high blood or are diabetic, of course, they're... <laughs> Their high blood shoot, their diabetic uh, shoot, that it almost reached to 300 to 400 over. So, nako conscious lang kami. Even me, I'm also a diabetic and a high blood person with something probably in a heart. So, I need my medicine. I'm not expecting that that is what we're going to happen to us for my past 34 years of struggle for the interests of the women and the people. So ganon, we stayed up to 10 o'clock in the evening, almost 10. Then we were distributed. Kasi pinapasok kami, lahat mo na kamay, dedicate doon sa, sa kanilang cards, paliwat kanan, shupan kan with the violation, apat na violation. I was enlightened when attorney uh, discuss yung mga RA na mga violation na talagang hindi na yes, ang ayon sa nangyari sa amin but that is their charges to us. So what happened, dinistribute kami. Ako, I was assigned to La Paz, supposed to be police station, na lima kami. And later on, we will let them get down from the car when we're about to be brought to the La Paz police station with five other colleagues, uh, including Father Marco. Father Marco is among us. He's a high FI, and he was the one who been put with a, siya lang yung pinusasan among the 42 people. Sabi namin, superstar ka, Padre. Bakit sa aning sobrang dadal kay sa'yo, ikaw yung pinasasan. So, it's really a heartbreaking na nangyari sa kanya. I-expect namin less na gawin yan sa pari. But, uh, so, pinababa kami, pinabalik muli sa La Paz Police Station and later on, three of us only were assigned to Iloilo City Police Station. Isa lang akong babae. So, ay, tinanong ko, Sa 20 of us who are women na dinakip, at 22 are men, one of it is priest and the, and the lawyer, isa lang akong ilagay doon sa ICPO, saan na yung kasama ko? Sabi na, eh, ito yung mga request. Kung hindi pa ako nagpagwersa, yung nagpat, nag, nagwala, ay hindi pa ako na-assign na ng kasama, nadadalhin doon <sighs> bilang kasama ko sa city jail. Sabi ko, ba't kami ganito kasi kami ko na daw yung high profile na kaaka lang ah, na mga leaders na baka maglusob yung mga friends in the countryside ay kami unang i-rescue so dapat kasi karitan. Sabi nyo, may ganong issue. So anyway, nang pumasok na kami sa jail, it's your first experience. Ang daming ibabawal. Kahit yung home ko, kahit yung gamot ko, you have to struggle pa para makapag. Sabi ko, ganito ko yan. Ba't mo ipaiwan? Tawagin mo yung head. And parang may siyempre i-diit mo talaga. So lahat-lahat iwan except for my handkerchief, for my mouth, uh, face mask, my, yung gamot ko na dala ko. So ganun, pagpasok mo doon sa city jail, siyempre bury ang lahat. Walang-wala. Walang CR, wala ka rin higaan. So ginigyan ka ng konting carton, walang electric fan. 
mamatay ka at magdusa dyan sa kakainit. Or may could not survive without air na mahangin talaga ako eh. So yung cartoon ko din nag uh, nag fear lang ako ng small piece hanggang umaga kang mag-ano dyan. Mag kayab para lang mayroon kang extra air na makasurvive. So kung magdumi ka o ano ka ba, maka doon ka sa baldusa, tapos kalagin mo yung jail mo para matawag mo yung guard na makalabas ka sa dubli-dubling lock ng jail doon pa sa isa ka, dalawa kasi yung silda mo at saka yung main, para ka makalabas at pumunta ng outside your jail na sila. Sabi ko, ay ganito pa lang kalabayan ng mga taong na preso. Tapos sa kabilang jail, ganun din jail ng lalaki, kabila kami jail ng babae. So dalawa kami. So ganun sabi ko, very good talaga. So ma-imagine mo yung ganitong ginagawa ng gobyerno na walang proper na pagpatupad ng batas kasi wala rin pala kami violation based din sa task authority. At sa katinupad naman namin ang tanta ng mga ginpang required nila, social distancing, with face mask, may quarantine pass, may ID, lahat yun. Tapos ang kaso namin, disobedience, illegal assembly, tapos mayroon iba-iba pang dinagdag na lang nila dalawa pa despite of questioning isang lawyer. Gusto kami ipa-exam. Early in the morning, doon pula sa nasa jail kami. So, ah, first time higa ako sa Baldosa na may kunting parton para lang makarest kasi takot rin ako mag-shoot yung high blood ko at saka yung diabetes ko na more than 212 at that time na yung check ko at saka yung blood pressure na 180 over 100 na wala ka rin gamot kasi hindi mo nadala. Gamot ko pang horny na one shot. So ganun katindi ang nakikita ko at mga violations. Sabi ko, ang police di ba protect and serve sa anayang orientation na yan? Dahil daw may COVID, eh, pinapagpupad pa namin eh kung anong mga gusto yung gawin namin. Sabi ko, kung tatay mo ba namatay, hindi ka ba alboroko? sa ang pagpas lang sa kanya, hindi true COVID na, na sakit, kundi true illegal uh, yung brutal killing o kung extrajudicial killing. So, napapakita na mga kung ano ang sistema ng lipunan in terms of respecting our women rights and the human rights of every individual. Kung pasabihin ganun, ang, ang presohan ay Rehabilitation Center. Hindi ano. Ito ay place where you will soon have your death. So, yun siguro lang maikling. Pwede kong ma-share. Uh, maraming salamat, Tita Lucy, sa iyong sharing. So, um, at this point, I don't see any questions yet to on sa ating chat box, but from the registration, we have uh, we have uh, a particular question. Uh, sige, pasahin natin. I think um, this question is for Attorney Josa. Uh, Attorney Josa, uh, the question is, ano pong mga maaring bang ng mga kababaihan o mamamayan na nakakaranas ng injustice lalo na sa kapanahunan ng COVID? Okay. Uh, we can seek accountability. I'm sorry. Is it on my video? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. We can exact or demand accountability in various platforms in many ways uh, because it is not um, limited to the legal arena. We can access different international mechanisms so that we can draw attention to the human rights situation here in the Philippines. But uh, we encourage everyone who has experienced violations of human rights like Dimple, like Lucy, to uh, document or what they experience and to gather evidence that uh, that they can gather and preserve right now because this will be useful when uh, the moment they decide to file counter charges against their arresting officers and all those who committed the violations uh, collectively also we can keep organizing ourselves 
homes and keep on demanding our right to health, um, particularly the, uh, the response of this government uh, to the needs of, uh, of women and uh, children and uh, the people at large in terms of um, addressing uh, health-based measures that will address uh, the different uh, uh, steps to finally combat uh, the uh, COVID-19 crisis, detect, isolate, treat, and finally reintegrate whoever will be afflicted by the disease. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it will be very uh, helpful if uh, right, uh, we can start uh, documenting, uh, writing down whatever happened to us, uh, writing down all the details that we can remember, especially the names and the units of the perpetrators. This will be extremely helpful for us uh, when we decide to file counter charges later. Okay, salamat, um, Attorney Josa. I, I think um, we have another uh, question here. Uh, wala pa rin sa chat box, but um, dun sa, from our registration, merong isang specific question, no? Uh, this is from UNF, uh, UN, United Nations Population Fund. So, I'm interested in knowing the situation of women and human rights in the Philippines during COVID-19. So, um may maraming mga sharing kanina with regards to this. Um, is there a systematic way of capturing this information across the country? So, yun yung isang uh, question. So, mag, may, may uh, related na answer na si Attorney Josa kanina that it is very important that we document um, these um, cases, uh, these incidents. Um, Siguro sa part ng Center for Women's Resources as a research um, institution na nag uh, the document ng mga experiences ng kababaihan yung uh, yung kasalukuyang pandemic it it limits also yung capacities and mobility ng mga um, institutions organizations para uh, kalapin itong mga datos na ito, itong mga experiences na ito. Pero, syempre, hindi tayo, hindi, hindi tayo mapipigilan ng pandemic o hindi tayo mapipigilan ng um, repression. And we are um, continuously documenting uh, these experiences, albeit um, digital siya, mas online, dahil hindi tayo makapunta sa communities. Pero siguro maganda din tong opportunity uh, para para uh, for collaboration sa iba't ibang mga institutions, organizations that that we can work together para systematically i-document um, itong mga cases ng uh, human rights violations against um, women, both civil and political, at saka yung mga violations sa economic, social, and cultural rights ng mga kababaihan. So, very open yung Center for Women's Resources at iba pang mga uh, women's organizations and institutions uh, dito. So, sige, me meron pa tayong isang question. Maganda yung isang question dito. Eh. Uh, what are the siguro this is um, especially for for those who are um, conducting community uh, initiatives, no? what are the collective and creative responses of women's organizations to issues arising from this pandemic? So, um, ano ba yung mga creative uh, ways natin to, to mitigate yung impacts sa mga kababaihan? So, um, would would someone um, from Gabriela Panay or nandito pa ba si Tim Paul or Sharon? Um, okay. Um, maganda yung question, that question from our friend from the U.S., from the U.N. is I think a very important question kasi not only because of uh, yung for purposes of documentation but 
all of this information will also, a documentation of this information will also uh, lead us to a process of moving forward. Because we have to be really thinking about how to move on from here. Eh? Dahil um, uh, medyo matagal na rin itong COVID pandemic na to, and there's so much that has happened uh, in various places of the, of the country. And there are so many instances of human rights, which, which uh, uh, human rights violations, and also questions arising uh, or questions related to how the law should now be interpreted in situations like this. No? Tapos yung mga actual um, um, cases of justice that has to be rendered to so many cases of police abuse. Kaya lahat nito mga data na to ay makakatulong sa pag-define ng agenda natin as a people and as, an, and as organizations collectively and, and uh, within our own sphere sa kung paano tayo, kung ano yung mga dapat nating gawin in the future uh, after the ECQ has been lifted uh, af or even before it is lifted. No? So napaka-profound actually nung, nung mga changes na dapat na mangyari after nitong experience natin na ito, not only in terms actually of human rights violations, but also in terms of defining our national and sectoral priorities now um, as a result of what we experienced during this COVID pandemic. So I think uh, all the experiences that we have had, whether at the personal level, whether as an organization, as a country, as a region, sector, etc., talagang dapat na maging isang conscious effort yung documentation ng lahat ng mga experience na ito because that will help define a national agenda for the country or a people's agenda sa post-COVID uh, pandemic scenario. Uh, can I add on to it? Yes. Hello, champ. Yes, it's Lucy, go on. Yeah. Uh, for us, especially if you are leaders with the different leaders and different communities, what we do, we let uh, yung yung campaign ba natin na wag matako, na patuloy yung pakikibaka natin. Although we are conscious sa mga dapat gawin, yung ginawa namin na pag-form ng health teams na may ensure na mga awareness, pag-join rin sa local barangay uh, LGU sa community na ma-feel nila na yung organization ay katuwang for the campaign to end COVID and to be to, to campaign to educate people na mag-free from COVID na ma-contaminate. And then, iba kasi pag hindi lang tayo na nanahimik bilang mga leaders ng kababaihan o kung anong sektor pa man, nakikita nila kasi kahit yung mga problema na hindi sila nakareceive ng mga mga relief doon o wants lang sila o kung may mga ano may mga corruptions no na ganito lang yung nakuha nila instead ng ganito sinisentralize nila sa ating team at sinisentro at mai mai ugnay pa rin sa tamang officials o kung may expose na rin kahit sa radio no na ganun para ma-respondihan so wala nating tulong siya na namatipil nila na hindi na nanahimik yung organization hindi tayo nakikip quiet lang na hintayin matapos ang COVID. So, we act, we action, no? Para makasuporta sa mga hinanain nila, sa mga problema. And we also, nakapalabas yung tayo ng campaign natin, fighting COVID and then exposing mga, kung ano mga katiwalian, ang demanding na dapat mapalaki ang budget, dapat mamadalian na palabasin yung testing kit para ma-insure natin yung life, yung safety ng mga mga So, nakatulong yan sa ating mga organized and non-organized na yung organizations pala ay may malaking pakil sa ganitong crisis, health crisis na na, na, na ano natin na, na na experience natin ngayon at uh, dapat lang patuloy tayo hindi siya maging entrance sa ating mga gawain as long na ma-insure ma natin yung safety natin. Hello champ. Yes, yes, thank you. Tita Lucy. Um, sige po, meron pa bang um, gustong mag-share mag uh, na kanilang comments or questions? Uh, we actually have a raised hand. Um, okay, so...
Sige po, you, you can type your questions dun sa ating chat box or if you'd like to um, give a brief um, intervention or comment, you can also um, say it sa ating uh, chat box. Sige, um, okay, merong isang question dito from Center for People's Media. Siguro, if Dimple is also here or Tita Lucy is still here. Um, may isang question, how are families coping given the ECQ, especially the mothers? Are food items including rice available, accessible, and affordable? Um, at ano po yung feedback ninyo on government government aid um, or action? So, um, any one of our speakers or anyone from the participants can also um, answer kasi pare-pareho nating um, experience ito. So, Sa amin kasi ganito, yung monitoring team namin, chinicheck, chinicheck, tapos may sinisindron, chinicheck kami kung anong binibigay. Anong content, enough ba? Weekly ba ito? Or uh, every another week? Tapos pag may mga problema, sina, sina, pinapasa sa amin, sinisindralize namin, tapos ipapasa, pinaparespondihan namin. Ini, ini, ang maganda naman kasi may ugnayan kami kay mayor, may report namin kay mayor, mayor na ganito ang nangyayari. Tapos, pag mahinang action, di may line kami sa mga media, pinitext lang sa mga media para ma-expose, para ma-respond yan. Kasi kahit sa ganong kalagayan, ang, ang corruption ka na hindi mo ngayon. Yung mga lahat na pamilya na isang family, nandiyan lahat po itong pamilya, dahil isang, sa isang bahay, tatlo sila, isa lang bibigyan kasi one household lang, na hindi naman po yan. At saka yung iba na mga mamalayo, mga ma-remote-remote, hindi na makakulong. So, ito'y nakatulong. And then, maganda sa nagang ini-incontate natin, ini-empower natin. Yung mga members, sabi namin, kung nag-greet niya kayo ng happy birthday, whatever dyan, do the, eh, gawin niyo ang social media as your pam pamamaraan na ma-expose yung mga katiwalian, mag-appreciate rin dyan, at saka mag-campaign para at least makin ng bawat ta na ay aware tayo sa pangyayari sa ating paligid. Alam natin ang ating mga karapatan at dapat natin natin Kasi kung hindi anos natin sila, i-empower, kung isang kayaan mo na lang, kung isang hindi na lang sila natinig, hindi nila ma-assert ang right. Especially, right to survive yan, ipagkain yun. Kung isang yung iba, may mga mer, kung iba may mga maliit na bata, ba't dalawang pak lang na maliit, yung iba ka, kung ka, kung yung pinakalapaw pag yung ganun, pag nakita namin, in-expose namin. Hindi naman maganda yung ganun. Dapat sa ganitong ang kalagayan, mas more yung may, ma may mga kaya at may, may opportunity na maka-access niya, itigay natin sa mga maghirap na mga mamamayan. So, isang paraan din yan na ma-expose ma natin, matulak at mag-demand, ma-assert nila yung kanilang mga. Importante, ayong mga organized, we let the people feel, we let the women feel, the nanay feel, na nandyan tayo na bilid, at sila may karapatan at huwag matakot na hindi man kasi kung saan hindi na sila mag-inip, baka daw hindi sila ilagay sa list. Sabi namin, hindi. Karapatan nyo yan. Pag listahan ay, simple, hindi mo maaboy. Lahat na pagdigyan ng malapit doon sa luwag, sabi nila, ay nandoon lang at paano yung iba na wala. Sabi namin, mas ka, pumunta ka doon sa barangay, yung idiman mo yung right mo. Tignan mo ko nandoon yung pangalan mo. Kung saan hindi mo sila may karapatan, ay unique na lang sila. It is not fair for that. Now, that's one way also to assert and to empower them to demand for their rights. Thank you, Tita Lucy. Um, Dimpol? Oo, oh, oh, yes. Uh, di, uh, sa kasalukuyan, no, dahil nandito kami sa community, di syempre, yung mga tao, binanggit ko naman na kanina, di sumbungan talaga yung 
yung mga yung uh, sentruhan talaga kami noong mga reklamo at mga problema nila no regarding ayuda, regarding pagbuli ng mga pulis sa kanila kasi magkakaugnay siya. For example, yung ilang mga cases kasi na kinakaharap ngayon, edi dahil nga magdadalawang buwan na no lalo na yung pedicab driver tricycle driver, jeepney driver, at syempre, yung mga asawa nila ay namumublema rin sa kung saan sila kukuha ng kanilang ano, no, ng kanilang uh, pagkain. Kung saan sila makakakuha ng pangulam, syempre. Di, ang ang nagiging resulta kasi, di, kahit bawal lumabas, mapipilitan silang lumabas para uh, para humanap nung uh, pagkain, harap na mauutangan, et cetera, et cetera. Di ang, gag- ang sagot naman nitong mga polis, eh, di dahil uh, hindi nga nila alam ano yung pakiramdam ng mga mahihirap, no? Na wala talagang pangkain. Hindi ang tendency nila, hulihin lang ng hulihin yung mga tao na lumalabas. Pag wala ka nga lang, ano, no? Pag wala ka lang bag na pamili o pamalengke ay bigla ka na lang huhuli na sasabihin sa yung uh, tumatambay ka lang. So mga ganung cases, edi kahit yung sa ayuda ano, bago nga kami mahuli sa katunayan na yan, kaya ka, kay, nung naaktuhan kami ng huli, meron merong dumadaing doon na mga driver na hindi sila nasama sa unang wave da. Kaya masamang-masamang masama yung loob nila kasi tigil pasada sila. Ano, kahit nung kinagabihan pa, ang isa din sa uh, inaalala nila after ng ECQ at mag-GCQ ay hindi pa rin makakabiyahin sila. Yun yung mga nagiging pro- Hello, Dean Paul. Hello? Oo, oh, naputol ako. Yes, yes. Yes, Timbol. Narinig na ako. Yes, oh, yes. Oh. Good. Yun yung nagiging, uh, mas, uh, madalas na nagiging problema, ano, hindi nakakasama sa SAP yung mga tao, lalo na yung mga renters, karamihan. So, yung, ano, nagiging trouble, eh di, uh, nakakailang survey na dito kasi, seven na, seven times nang nagpapalista. Yung mga tao, umaasa sila doon sa darating na ayuda. Kaya lang ang nagiging trouble, ang banggit talaga ng LGU, mismo sa atin, nalbawa si Mayor Marcy particular, ay talagang ano, yung budget ay nakabatay doon sa budget lang na alatid sa isang city. At hindi doon sa kung ilan ang nangangailangan based sa mga survey. Kaya ang magiging trouble talaga niyan ay sa baba, sa, sa mga tao, edi eh mag, mag ano yan, mag tatanong, uh, yung iba ay nagsisilipan na nakakuha na yan, bakit nakakuha na ng ganito. So yung, yung ganong typical na problema ay magiging trouble talaga siya ng mga tao. Butom talaga yung dadanasin ng mga tao sa community lalo na doon sa mga ano uh, depressed na depressed na area so yon uh, ang ang maganda nga din tignan uh, ilabas talaga yun ng mga barangay kung sino na yung mga nakakuha ng ano kung ilan na ang nabigyan di sa bisa mga survey nila na pangpito na nga dito sa amin na Uh, kung ilan talaga yung mas nangangailangan. Kasi sa totoo lang, hindi sapat yung inilaan dito, no? Doon sa mga komunidad na gaya, na gaya ng, ano, ng Marikina. So, ayun. Okay, salamat, uh, Dimpol. So, um, I don't see any more questions sa ating chat box at Mukhang nasagot na yung, uh, mostly yung questions doon sa, uh, mula sa ating uh, registration link, no? Um, siguro just to, to um, wrap this up, I would like to um, ask for a few parting words from our uh, main speakers. So, Attorney Josa and uh, Miss Sharon. So, yes. Um, Sharon? Yeah, okay. Um, in response also dun, dun sa last question that was raised by one of, one of our participants, no? um, 
una, we have to look also at the question of exclusivity of food aid or uh, uh, government aid that uh, is being rendered to our uh, people. No? Ang daming dinisqualify. Samantalang, in a situation like this, dapat nga mas inclusive as possible yung uh, government aid that should be given to the people. And then there's also data that uh, sec um, two months into the pandemic, and millions of families, I, and if I'm not mistaken, about one-third or one-half, which easily translates to about seven million families are still, of those who are included, no, uh, are, are still uh, not yet, uh, have not yet received any aid from government. Um, one, the Voices of Women view you know, food security is a basic human right. So when we talk about human rights, we not only talk about the actual cases of abuses, at saka yung stretching of the law to um, to suit the um, the interests of the powerful but we also look at the provision of adequate and sustained um, economic aid to the people as a fundamental human rights or human rights so um, it is very important at this point that we are able to document all these experiences that we sustain the organizing and empowerment effort that we are doing, organizations are doing. In fact, we should really encourage people to do that, no? yung self-organizing, para talagang uh, uh, yung ating mga batayang, karapatang pantao, ay patuloy natin may paglaban kahit nasa ganitong klaseng sitwasyon. At important din na yung ating actual human rights work no? ay nare-relate natin dito sa mga economic issues na ito kasi um, yung, yung ating pangangalaga and promotion of human rights or defense of our fundamental uh, uh, human rights and freedoms, ito yung tuntungan din dun sa or magiging basis ng mga actual concrete measures that we think should be done and also in terms of policy reforms that will have to be done now if not possible in the future and also in terms of defining the people's agenda that we have to advance after the pandemic is over or in the later phases of the pandemic. There's also one thing that has to be uh, discussed, no? yung, yung despondence and level of mental anxiety that it is causing, especially, well, not only to women, yung mga experiences and stories na nadidinig namin. Of course, we we uh, on facebook no yung i think the other day yan, or yesterday we had this uh, or read this story about a lola who committed suicide because she was not included in the ano, financial aid that was given by the barangay but then we also hear stories of um uh, uh, men yung mga family breadwinners saying um why don't we just commit suicide my entire family just commit suicide because we have not been receiving any aid so that's one aspect also of this pandemic that we uh, have to look into. No, yung not only the actual physical and economic and political suffering that we experience, but also in terms of how do we restore no, yung, yung faith, I mean, yung, um, how do we restore yung confidence and yung, um, yung will to live among the people. And I think one of the really important things that has to be done is organizing empowerment and defense of human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Attorney Joseph? Yes. Ang ganda na sinabi ni Tita Sharon. Parang wala na akong madagdag doon. Siguro reminder na lang na but, uh, kailangan natin actually responsibility natin na kailangan uh, ipagpatuloy yung na panghawakan yung mga karapatan natin. Kasi marami namang instances na nasa ilalim tayo ng ECQ, yung pushback natin, di ba, nagbunga rin naman eh, yung patuloy natin pagre-reklamo, di ba? Kaya huwag tayo panghinaan ng loob. At uh, tandaan na lang din natin, yung ito, magandang linya sa jurisprudence, gusto ko lang i-share sa inyo. The vitality of democracy lies not um, in the rights it guarantees, but courage of the people to assert and use them whenever they are wrong or uh, ignored or infringed. So, yun lang po. Uh, yun lang po aking parting words. Maraming salamat sa uh, pag-iimbita sa CWR at sa BAUJP. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat.
Okay, maraming salamat, Attorney Josa um, and Ms. Sharon Cabuzao. At this point, um, uh, dahil uh, nag-extend tayo ng one hour dahil napakayaman ng ating um, palakayan, uh, na isang nating magpasalamat uh, sa sa lahat ng mga participants uh, na dumalo ngayong hapon. Uh, maraming salamat sa uh, Gabriela Iloilo, uh, kay Dimpol, kay uh, Ms. Amira Lidasan, at kay uh, David Panelo for, for sharing your experiences. Um, muli, uh, na mag maganda yung, ano, yung mga binanggit ni Attorney Josa at ni Sharon, no? panahon ng pandemic, hindi tuloy-tuloy uh, yung ating mga gawain, tuloy-tuloy yung ating uh, panindigan para sa ating mga karapatan bilang uh, bilang mga kababaihan at bilang mga mamayan. So, uh, magkita-kita po tayo sa uh, susunod pang mga talakayan. Uh, muli mula sa Center for Women's Resources, Gabriela at Voices of Women for Justice and Peace. Maraming salamat po at magandang gabi sa ating lahat. Magandang gabi din.